Good morning. If everyone could take their seats. My name is Edith Hambrick and I'm the chairperson of the hospital outpatient payment advisory panel. I would like to extend a hearty Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services welcome to the 2018 meeting of the advisory panel on hospital outpatient payment. First, I'd like to start with an introduction of the panel members. How about starting over there, Dr. Nolan? Certainly. Um, yes, I'm Agatha Nolan. I'm a pharmacist with uh, HCA. Um, I do billing compliance um, for our company and uh, appreciate the welcome, Edith. Good morning, I'm Karen Lambert. I'm president of Advocate Good Shepherd Hospital, part of the Advocate Aurora Health System. Good morning, Dawn Francis. I'm a gastroenterologist at Mayo Clinic Florida and serve as the medical director for the outpatient practice there. Good morning, I'm Ken Flo. I'm an emergency physician and the physician vice president for acute care at Caris Health in Minnesota. Good morning, I'm Scott Manneker. I'm a pulmonary and critical care physician and vice chair of medicine at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. Good morning, I'm Erica Hardy. I'm the corporate coding manager for FMOL, a health system in Louisiana. Ruth Londe, senior vice president, patient care revenue at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York. Good morning, Norm Thompson. I'm a radiologist and associate CMO at AU Health in Augusta, Georgia. With us today through this webinar, we have presenters, commenters, representatives from sister agencies, and members of the public. We welcome and look forward to your presentations and comments. Um, we can have a few housekeeping details by Ms. Elise Berenger, who's the designated fellow official for the panel. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, just a reminder that we have a few panel members coming off this year and that we will still be accepting um, rolling nominations. And that was the only update for me. Thank you. Just a few, as you know, get ready for the details. The final rule for the hospital inpatient prospective payment system or IPPS for fiscal year 2019 was put on display August the 2nd, 2018, and is scheduled for, it was scheduled for publication on Friday, August 17th. I haven't checked to see if it actually got published, but that's when it was scheduled for publication. The notice of proposed rulemaking for the hospital outpatient prospective payment system ambulatory surgery center for calendar year 2019 was published in the Federal Register on July 31st, 2018, 83 Federal Register um, page 337046. If you wish to comment, comments must be submitted by 5 p.m. on September the 24th, 2018. The notice of proposed rulemaking for the Medicare physician fee schedule for calendar year 2019 was published in the Federal Register on July 27, 2018. Um, the comment period closes at 5 p.m. on September 10th. Just to remind everybody what the charter says, which is actually found under tab C or D in um, the booklet. The, charter sh the panel shall advise the secretary and the administrator of CMS about the clinical integrity of the APC groups and their associated weights. The panel is technical in nature and it will deal with such issues as addressing whether procedures are similar both clinically and in terms of resource use, assigning new CPT codes to APCs, reassigning codes to different APCs, reconfiguring the APCs into new APCs, evaluating the required level of supervision for hospital outpatient services, etc. The subject matter is limited to these and related topics. Unrelated topics are not subjects for discussion. Unrelated topics include, but are not limited to, the conversion factor, charge compression, pass-through payments for medical devices and drugs, wage adjustments, the types of practitioners who are permitted to supervise outpatient services and the like. As I mentioned, a cop copy of the charter is in today's booklet and is also on the web. The panel will hear presentations and comments primarily related to the CY 2019 calendar year, I'm sorry, CY 2018 calendar year final rule 
and the calendar year 2019 notice of proposed rulemaking. Comments that are not primarily related to the rule may be ruled out of order. Now I'd like to walk you to what's colloquially known and finally known as the two times rule. Section 1833T2 of the Social Security Act provides that subject to certain exceptions, the items and services within an APC group cannot be considered comparable with respect to the use of resources if the highest median or mean cost if elected by the secretary for an item or service in the group is more than two times greater than the lowest median cost for an item or service within the same group. In general, we use the geometric mean cost of the item of service in implementing this provision. The statute authorizes the secretary to make exceptions to the two times rule in unusual cases, such as low volume items and services. So let's turn to the um, listing in the back for the panel members. You have a copy of your uh, APC. And if you go to APC 5051, which is on pages four, through six, you will notice that there is no violation of the two times rule. The significant procedure, which is indicated by the star, the, uh, with the lowest geometric mean cost is 17110 at $108.74. And the highest significant procedure is 11301 with a geometric mean cost of $214.74. So you note that does not violate the two times rule, not by much, but it doesn't violate the two times rule. The next um, procedure I'd like to, uh, APC I'd like to draw your attention to is 5113, page 30 through 41. So you'll note that, the, um, that there might be a two times violation. This is level three musculoskeletal procedures by the question marks that appear to the side of the APC. So the lowest significant um, um, procedure is on page 32, is 28124 with the geometric mean cost of $1,964.15. And the procedure with the, this is a big APC, which as you know, we'll have a presentation about that, um, is on page 40, um, CPT code 28299, um, with the geometric mean costs of 39.52 and 95 cents. So that is an example of what we would call uh, an APC, which potentially um, violates the two times rule. All presentations should not exceed five minutes in length for an individual or organization. The chair may further limit time allowed for presentations due to the number of oral presentations if necessary. In addition to formal oral presentations, there will be opportunity during the meeting for public oral comments that will be limited to one minute for each individual and a total of three minutes um, per organization. Please queue up uh, for those on the phone Please queue up as instructed by Ms. Brianna Spate if you wish to address the panel. Please clearly identify yourself and your organization if applicable before speaking. So first I'd like to give Ms. Spate an opportunity to uh, announce what the rules of the road are as far as queuing up to give a comment from the public if you're not in the room. Thank you. So for a Q&A session, we have the chat box where you can, well, you can ask the questions through the chat box or use your raised hand feature or you can, um, I will unmute the lines and I will unmute you guys individually for Q&A. Thank you, Ms. Bate. We will have an introduction from a welcome, another CMS welcome, hers will be better than mine, from my boss, Ms. Carol Blackford, the director of the Hospital Inventory Policy Group. Thank you, Dr. Hambrick. 
Good morning, everyone. As Edith mentioned, I'm Carol Blackford, the director of the hospital and the ambulatory policy group here at CMS. And I'm pleased to welcome you all, whether in person um, or by phone, for those of us who are joining us uh, that way, to the advisory panel meeting on hospital outpatient payment, affectionately known as the HOP panel. This is the 31st meeting of the HOP panel since its inception in 2001. <clears throat> Excuse me. And as always, CMS sincerely appreciates the panel's expertise and uh, values its contributions to improve CMS policy by strengthening the connection between Medicare payments and high quality and efficient care for our beneficiaries. Shortly, Tiffany Swigert, the Director of the Division of Outpatient Care, and David Rice, the Deputy Director of the Division of Outpatient Care, will provide a policy overview of both last year's 2018 OPPS final rule as well as the recently released 2019 OPPS proposed rule, which still has an open public comment period. We do recognize that given the timing of the release of the proposed rule, there was a shortened presentation and comment submission period, and we are grateful for your insightful and valuable comments, but uh, we do hope that you will take advantage of this opportunity to share your thoughts on the proposed rule items, which are uh, in scope for the HOP panel to consider. While not all issues included in the proposed rule are within the scope of this panel, I encourage everyone to take this opportunity to engage with us on those issues that are within the scope of the panel and also encourage you all to share your feedback in the form of written public comments by the September 24th deadline so your important feedback can be taken into account in the development of the final regulation. Now, I would like to say a few words about the HOP panel, specifically, CMS has long recognized the importance of the public's role in developing effective policies, including the assistance of advisory panels such as this one. These advisory committees ensure that public involvement, transparency, and expert advice are part of our federal policymaking process. And this specific panel, as you know, is charged with advising the secretary and the administrator regarding the clinical integrity of APC groups and their associated groups' weights. These are fundamental components of the OPPS that have significant effect on CMS's ability to support beneficiary choice, lower beneficiary cost, and promote high quality, efficient hospital outpatient services. And at this time, I would like to personally thank our panel members who are rotating off of the panel prior to our next meeting, Dr. Don Francis at the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville, Florida, uh, Ruth Landy uh, at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York City, New York, Michael Schroyer with Ascension Health in Anderson, Indiana, and Dr. Norman Thompson with uh, Georgia Health Medical Center in Augusta, Georgia. Thank you. To all of our panel members, again, we sincerely appreciate your invaluable contributions and professional expertise and experiences to this public process behind CMS's payment system. And finally, CMS uh, published a notice in the Federal Register on January 26, 2018, which I'm sure um, everyone has taken a look at. And uh, this notice uh, requests nominations to fill vacancies on the HOP panel. This notice is an open notice, meaning that CMS is accepting nominations on an ongoing basis. We anticipate being able to fill several of the vacancies with new panel members in time for our next HOP panel meeting and we invite you to nominate someone who you think would be a great asset to the HOP panel. Thank you again, and I look forward to the discussions today. Thank you, Ms. Blackford. Next up, we have the overview that was mentioned by Ms. Blackford. Um, Ms. Tiffany Swaggart and Mr. David Rice will be leading that discussion, and all the slides are up, okay. Hi everyone, I'm Tiffany Swaggart. I'm the director of the Division of Outpatient Care. Welcome to the HOP panel. I'm gonna give a, a brief introduction of the staff that we have that makes uh, this meeting possible. Some of them are in the room, and if you're in the room, I want you to raise your hand. Others are behind the scenes um, doing other activities. So um, first, I wanted to acknowledge the deputy director of the Division of Outpatient Care, David Rice. Um, as well as our data team co-leaders, Eric Chuang and Stephen Johnson, our designated federal official, Elise Berenger, and several analysts, including Marjorie Baldo, Chuck Braver, Raymond Bulls, Scott Talaga, Isaac Kamara, Corey Duke, 
Marina Kushnirova, Josh McFeeders, Leela Strong, Twy Jackson, Juan Cortez, and Asha Washington. Next, I think I'm supposed to do my own slides. Let's see. Uh, just a reminder before Dave goes over the 2018 final rule, the OPPS is a prospective payment system as indicated by the, the acronym there. It's not a fee schedule, so there are payments uh, which are grouped um, by law into like things um, by resources as well as clinical similarity. Um, that is a requirement by law. I think a lot of the presentations that you will hear today um, relate to this very concept, so this is an important concept to keep in mind. Um, in addition, Dr. Hambrick already um, gave some of the, the feedback on when the, the final rule was released, so I will turn it over now to David Rice to give an overview of the 2018 OPPS final rule. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm David Rice, the Deputy Director of the Division of Outpatient Care. And I'll be quickly walking through the major changes in the 2018 OPPS final rule. There we go. So the uh, final rule in 2018 provided an overall OPPS payment update of 1.35%, uh, which was a 2.7% market basket update, uh, minus 0.6 percentage points for the multi-factor productivity update, and minus an additional 0.7 uh, percent adjustment required by law. This final rule uh, contained a significant change to the OPPS payment for drugs purchased under the 340B program. Separately payable, non-pass-through, non-vaccine drugs and biologicals acquired under the 340B program would no longer be paid average sales price plus 6% uh, and beginning in 2018 would be paid at ASP minus 22.5%. Certain uh, cancer hospitals, children's hospitals, and rural soul community hospitals were excluded from those drug payment reductions for 2018. Uh, CMS also removed total knee arthroplasty from the inpatient only list, which allows Medicare beneficiaries the option to undergo this procedure in uh, an outpatient setting when a clinician believes that the setting is appropriate. Additionally, uh, a tenant of a prospective payment system is to package payment of all integral, ancillary, supportive, dependent, or adjunctive services into payment for primary services. And in 2015, CMS had conditionally packaged payment for ancillary services assigned to ambulatory payment classification groups with a geometric mean cost of $100 or less, but excluded certain low-cost drug administration services from this policy. To continue CMS's work toward bundling payments under the OPPS and encouraging hospital efficiencies, CMS conditionally packaged payment for low-cost drug administration services uh, for 2018. In the 2009 and 2010 final rules, CMS clarified that direct physician supervision is generally required for hospital outpatient therapeutic <coughs> services that are furnished in hospitals, critical access hospitals, and in provider-based departments of hospitals. For several years, there's been a moratorium on the enforcement of the direct supervision requirement for critical access hospitals and small rural hospitals, with the latest moratorium on enforcement expiring on December 31st, 2016. In the 2018 final rule, CMS reinstated the non-enforcement of direct supervision requirements for outpatient therapeutic services in critical access hospitals and small rural hospitals having 100 or fewer beds for 2018 and 2019. Finally, under the OPPS, payment for skin substitutes is packaged into payment for associated surgical procedures. These products are assigned to either a high-cost group or a low-cost group, depending on how costly they are relative to certain cost thresholds. Consistent with current policy, uh, for 2018, CMS finalized its proposal that a skin substitute product that did not exceed either the 2018 mean unit cost 
or per day cost threshold uh, for 2018, but was assigned to the high cost group for 2017, uh, they would still be assigned to the high cost group for 2018. Uh, now I'll turn the presentation back over to Tiffany Swigert to discuss the 2019 OPPS proposed rule. Thank you, Dave. As Dr. Hambrick mentioned, the OPPS proposed rule was released on July 25th and has a 60-day public comment period, which will end on September 24th of this year. Um, we are anticipating that the final rule, as um, required by law, will be displayed in the Federal Register by November 1st of 2018. Um, I'm going to just highlight a, a number of uh, the major proposals that were included in that rule. Um, you'll be hearing presentations which cover a lot of these proposals and presentations by the Division of Outpatient Care, which we'll go into a bit more detail in the background. The overall update, rate update, to hospitals that are paid under the OPPS um, were, was increased by 1.25% including all adjustments. Um, continuing the trend of increased payments under the OPPS, payments total expenditures are expected to be around $75 billion this year, which includes uh, Medicare payments as well as beneficiary cost sharing. Um, and that's about a $5 billion increase over last year. There were several proposals which um, we term site neutral. The term site neutral means the payment, um, regardless of the, the setting of care, is similar or the same for a similar service described by the same HCPCS or CPT code. There are several proposals related to site neutral payment um, in the proposed rule this year. One has to do with the payment for the clinic visit under the OPPS. That uh, proposal is to reduce the payment for the clinic visit when billed by a hospital outpatient department um, that is off campus of the hospital and to pay it rather than the full OPPS payment rate to pay it the physician fee schedule equivalent rate. Um, this proposal has to do with unnecessary increases in the utilization of covered outpatient department services and there are more details about why CMS believes that the payment for the clinic visit may be driving unnecessary utilization under the outpatient prospective payment system. This proposal would save both Medicare beneficiaries and the Medicare program a combined estimated $760 million in 2019 alone. This proposal is not budget neutral meaning that the, the funds that are saved are not redistributed under the payment system. In addition, there was a proposal related to uh, service line expansion um, furnished at off-campus provider-based departments. This proposal is connected to a provision of law um, affectionately known as Section 603, which is Section 603 of the Bipartisan Budget Act of 2015. That law, in a nutshell, uh, determined that Medicare should no longer pay for certain um, services that are provided in an off-campus department of a hospital um, and CMS had implemented this provision in large part in the 2017 rulemaking cycle. However, in this proposed rule, CMS continues its implementation of the provision by stating that any service line that was not provided by an off-campus department of a hospital as of the date of enactment of that law, which was November 2nd, 2015, can no longer be paid under the OPPS and would instead be paid under the physician fee schedule. Um, there are details in the proposed rule that talks about the clinical families of services that CMS has proposed. Um, any service that was not provided in one of those clinical families of services would be subject to the, the payment adjustment if that proposal is finalized. In addition, there are several proposals related to drug payment policy under the, the OPPS. Um, as David Rice mentioned last year, CMS adopted a policy to pay 
drugs that are required under the 340B um, drug discount program at ASP minus 22.5%. This year's proposed rule continues implementation of that provision and states that even for hospital departments that are not paid um, under Section 603 of the Bipartisan Budget Act, um, which refers to the term non-accepted, because those hospitals are still eligible for 340B discounts and because there's an incentive to furnish drugs in those non-accepted departments, CMS has proposed that the, the new drug adjusted payment rate of ASP minus 22.5% would apply to drugs furnished in those departments as well. In addition, related to biosimilar biological products, CMS has proposed that for a biosimilar that does not have drug pass-through status, that the payment shall be for a 340B drug, ASP minus 22.5% of the biosimilar instead of ASP minus 22.5% of the reference product. In addition, CMS also proposed that in those cases where ASP data are not available, um, when CMS would otherwise make a payment at wholesale acquisition cost plus 6%, CMS is proposing to instead pay wholesale acquisition cost plus 3% across the board. In addition, CMS has proposed to change uh, what we consider to be a device-intensive procedure. Device-intensive status is granted to those procedures where the device portion of the cost of the total procedure is significant. Um, typically, that percentage has been 40%, greater than 40%. In this proposed rule, we propose to lower that threshold down to greater than 30%. In addition, um, any procedure that involves a single-use device could be device-intensive, uh, regardless of whether the device remains in the body after the conclusion of the procedure. Finally, with respect to comprehensive APCs, CMS has continued its implementation of this policy. A comprehensive APC is an episode-based payment for uh, major procedures and for observation services. There are already 65 um, comprehensive APCs, and CMS has proposed to add three, um, I'm sorry, the three additional ones brings it to 65 for 2019, and you'll hear um, some information about those newly proposed APCs, comprehensive APCs. That concludes my presentation. I turn the floor over to Dr. Hambrick. Thank you. Any questions, comments? Panel? Okay, now we're gonna move into the um, subcommittee reports. Um, the first one we'll hear from is the Visits and Observations Subcommittee from Dr. Norm Thompson. Thank you. The Visits and Observations Subcommittee met by WebEx on August 20th, 2018. The subcommittee reviewed the final calendar year 2018 OPPS payment prices relative to visits and the Comprehensive Observation Services CAPC. The subcommittee discussed the calendar year 2019 OPPS proposed rule, specifically the clinic visit and emergency department modifier proposals. The committee additionally discussed currently available calendar year 2017 and calendar year 2016 frequency and mean cost claims data for visits and for the Comprehensive Observation Services, CAPC. The subcommittee discussed the currently available calendar year 2017 and calendar year 2016 frequency and distribution claims data for observation services. The subcommittee has the following recommendations. Number one, that the subcommittee recommend that the work of the Visits and Observation Subcommittee continue. Number two, the committee recommends that CMS continue to report clinic and emergency department visit and observation claims data. And if CMS identifies changes in patterns of utilization or cost to bring those issues before the subcommittee in the future. Third, the subcommittee recommends that CMS report data on what percentage of observation stay claims greater than 48 hours have a date of service that begins on a Friday to investigate if weekend service is an impact on long observation claims. And fourth, 
And most importantly, the Visits and Observations Subcommittee recommends that Dr. Scott Maneker serve as the subcommittee chair for the 2019 HOP panel. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. Are there any questions um, from the panel for Dr. Thompson? If not, I'll entertain a motion to accept the minutes of the subcommittee, uh, the report of the subcommittee. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Welcome, Dr. Manneker. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Amber. <laughs> Next, we'll hear from the Ambulatory Payment Classification APC Group and Status Indicator Assignments uh, Subcommittee Report. Dr. Dawn Francis will give us that report. Thank you. Thank you. So the Ambulatory Payment Classification Group and Status Indicator Subcommittee met on August the 9th. Um, we reviewed and discussed the following issues based on what was submitted externally for presentations received by CMS. The first presentation we reviewed was clinic visits, the proposal to reduce payment rate for non-accepted off-campus provider-based department to the site-specific physician fee schedule rate. We reviewed comprehensive APCs, complexity adjustments, and impacts on access. Autologous stem cell transplantation, the request to create a new comprehensive APC. Packaging policy, impact on access to care, correct coding of packaged services, and packaging of skin substitutes. Non-opioid post-surgical pain management drugs, the request for separate payment for non-opioid pain management drugs. Device edits, the request to evaluate the need to reinstate all device ed edits. Device intensive threshold, the, uh, to the request to support a proposal to lower device intensive threshold to device cost being at least 30% of the APC geometric mean. Specific APC change requests, um, including endovascular procedures to consider creating a five or six level APC structure, musculoskeletal procedures, the request to consider creating a new APC between level five and level six, uh, CAR-T drugs and related services, the request to separately pay for services for leukapheresis and dose preparation procedures, the resin procedure, the request was to reassign CPT code 538X3 from APC 5373 um, to either APC 5374 or APC 5375. Uh, this, our, our, our committee, um, as I mentioned, just reviewed all these requests in detail. The subcommittee, as far as recommendations, deferred recommendations on all of these above stakeholder requests on which there will be a public presentation until after the presentation has been made to the full panel. The subcommittee recommends that the work of the subcommittee for APC group and SIA assignments continue. And finally, the subcommittee recommends that Dr. Agatha Nolan will serve as the chair of the APC group and uh, SIA subcommittee. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Francis. Um, are there any questions on the panel for Dr. Francis or any of the members who attended the subcommittee meeting? As mentioned, we'll hold that report in abeyance until the end when the presentations have been, have been given. Lastly, but not leastly, we'll hear from the data subcommittee. And um, did they give it to you, Ms. Hardy? The, the notes? Okay. Um, so Mr. Schwari was not able to be here and he didn't attend the meeting, but Ms. Hardy will give us the report. Good morning. The data subcommittee met on August 16th and we discussed the CMS staff presented information on the claims accounting process that was used to develop calendar year 2018 OPPS payment rates and answered questions from the subcommittee members. The subcommittee reviewed and discussed the external HUP meeting presentation report data on package costs from the provider roundtable. And the subcommittee discussed cost changes associated with APCs fluctuating by greater than 10% between the calendar year 2017 OPPS final rule and the calendar year 2018 OPPS. Our recommendations from the data subcommittee are, the data subcommittee recommends that CMS provide the subcommittee a list of APCs fluctuating significantly in cost prior to each hot panel meeting. The we also recommend that the CMS provide the subcommittee a presentation on the claims accounting process prior to each hot panel meeting. Number three, recommend the external stakeholders request for more transparency with package payments on which there will be a public presentation until 
after the presentation has been made to the full panel. The subcommittee also recommends that the work of the sub data subcommittee will continue. <coughs> and finally, the data subcommittee recommends that I will serve as the subcommittee chair for the 2019 hot panel. Thank you, Ms. Hardy. Are there any questions from the panel for Ms. Hardy? Okay, again, we'll hold that report in advance since we do have a, uh, a presentation um, that was relevant to the data subcommittee. So now let's move into the presentations. First up um, is Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson University and Aggressive Analytics, Dr. Eugene Viscusi. Okay. And Mr. James Scott, and if there's another person sitting there that wants to speak, just sitting with you. If not, that's fine too. Um, just come to this table right here. And then if you get the, um, the slide advancer on top. Well, wherever you're comfortable. Okay, so um, page five are the presentations, is the presentation in your booklet. And then if you first will introduce yourselves, tell us who you are, and then you can move forward with your presentation. Good morning. My name's Jim Scott, and I'm the president and CEO of Applied Policy. I'm pleased to be working on this project with Brady Augustine, who is Aggressive Analytics, uh, but uh, we're separate uh, entities. And I'm going to lead off the presentation uh, before I turn it over to Dr. Viscusi. Um, sorry, just one. I did have a little. I, I'm sorry. I think we were supposed to get an overview first. You want to do a second? Okay, go ahead then. Go ahead, sir. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so we are both Dr. Vescuzzi and I are paid consultants of uh, Heron Therapeutics. And uh, Dr. Viscusi's views are explicitly his own and not those of Thomas Jefferson University or of the American Society of Regional Anesthesia and Pain Medicine, for which he is the president-elect. Um, the purpose of the presentation today is that as this, it, within this panel's charter, uh, it encourages the efficient hospital outpatient care um, and, but sometimes that has the consequence of encouraging the least expensive care, which is not always the most appropriate care. Um, we're in the midst of an opioid epidemic, and so the current payment system encourages the use of the least expensive post-surgical post pain management medicines, which happens to be opioids, um, when newly coming to market will be some uh, non-opioid pain medications that can reduce the opioid exposure. Uh, even after the patient leaves the recovery room, uh, possibly impacting, uh, reducing the need for opiate, opioid prescriptions uh, that they would take home. So uh, on the slides, um, obviously the fighting the opioid epidemic is a priority of the Department of Health and Human Services. And uh, this slide shows that uh, Secretary Azar has said as much. Um, the, I think we're all aware of the impact of the opioid crisis, but it's particularly related to Medicare for two reasons. First of all, it costs billions of dollars annually, and the opioid use amongst elderly Americans has nearly doubled over the past 10 years. So with that, I'd like to, um, for Dr. Viscusi to say better than I could, how uh, the surgical setting is a gateway to addiction that can be prevented. Thank you. So uh, again, by way of introduction, I'm a professor of anesthesiology at Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia, and I am the president-elect of ASRA. We are the one society dedicated to acute and chronic pain in perioperative medicine. 
Um, so these are extremely important issues. And, and this concept that surgery is the gateway to addiction for many patients is a major concern of our society. 40 million patients have surgery a year. We used to think that opioid exposure for pain had little impact on uh, the potential for chronicity of opioid use, and we know that is absolutely not the case. Um, the recent data suggests between 6 and 10 percent of patients who have surgery will still be using opioids in a year. And it's not related to the severity of surgery. Major or minor surgery, there still is this signal for opioid chronicity. And uh, the concern is, is, is that uh, the real goal is opioid avoidance or absolutely minimizing the opioids that patients get in the perioperative process. The recent CDC data from last year showed that when you get around five days of opioid exposure, uh, that's when you see this rise in the potential for use at uh, a year. So we know that there are billions of leftover opioids, um, you know, between um, 60 and 92 percent of patients uh, report unused opioids. These end up in the medicine cabinet. Uh, half of, more than half of opioid abuse uh, or misuse comes from the diversion of drugs that are left over. So there is a substantial problem from the use of opioids, and, and I, I think um, we needlessly expose patients to opioids in the perioperative process, and the goal is really to minimize or to absolutely uh, avoid opioids in the perioperative process. And by doing so, uh, you're going to uh, dramatically reduce this burden of long, longer-term opioid use. You have about two minutes left. We're right on time. So uh, this panel has the opportunity to support uh, the use of innovative non-opioid treatments for the treatment of post-surgical pain. Um, got ahead of myself. <coughs> So under uh, current policies, CMS considers all items related to the surgical outcome and provided during the hospital stay in which the surgery is performed, including post-surgical pain management drugs, to be part of the surgery for purposes of um, the drug and biological surgical supply packaging policies. For other physician-administered drugs, as you can see from the previous uh, uh, presentation on 340B, those are all paid separately. So there's already a policy to pay separately for most physician-administered drugs used in hospital outpatient departments. So the request is for um, innovative uh, non-opioid uh, treatments for post-surgical pain to be paid separately the same way that other physician-administered drugs are paid under the hospital outpatient prospective payment system and not always packaged into the procedure for which they are used. And then with our last minute, I'd like to give it back to Dr. Viscusi. Sure. So <clears throat> we have uh, an investigational product that's uh, still uh, unpublished data, but the phase three trials from HTX uh, 011 showed a dramatic reduction and avoidance of opioids. Uh, in the hernia model, 51% of patients undergoing hernia repair did not get opioids in the first 72 hours, and then uh, 95 and 84.5% respectively remained opioid free from days 10 and uh, 28. Uh, statistically significant against standard bupivacaine, which is the, the most common standard of care. Uh, this uh, demonstrates a, a you know, dramatic reduction in uh, opioid use with over 90% of patients remaining opioid-free through 10 days post-op. Uh, historically, 86% of patients having hernia repairs uh, will have an opioid prescription filled within seven days. So it's a significant data to show reduction in the perioperative use of opioids. Thank you for your presentation. Now we'll have an overview, wrong order, apologize, I'll get it together, from Ms. Leela Strong. Thank you, Dr. Hambrick. OP OPPS and ASC payment system packaging policies are designed to support CMS's strategic goal of using larger payment bundles to maximize hospitals' incentives to provide care in the most efficient manner. 
Since calendar year 2014, drugs that function as a supply when used in a surgical procedure have been packaged under the OPPS and ASC payment systems regardless of the cost of the drugs. The costs associated with packaging with packaged drugs that function as a supply are included in the rate setting methodology for the surgical procedures with which they are billed and the payment rate for the associated procedure reflects the cost of the packaged drug and other packaged items and services to the extent that they are billed with a procedure. We consider all items that are related to the surgical outcome and provided during the hospital stay in which the surgery is performed, including post-surgical pain management drugs to be part of the surgery for the purposes of our drug and biological surgical supply packaging policy. Accordingly, payment for drugs and biologicals that function as a supply in a surgical procedure or diagnostic test are pack is packaged into the payment for the surgical procedure or diagnostic test. Recently, the President's Commission on Combating Drug Addiction and the Opioid Crisis, or the Commission, recommended that CMS examine payment policies for certain drugs that function as a supply, specifically non-opioid pain management treatments. The Commission's report included a recommendation for CMS to, quote, review and modify rate-setting policies that discourage the use of non-opioid treatments for pain, such as certain bundled payments that make alternative treatment options, cost prohibitive for hospitals and doctors, particularly those options for treating immediate post-surgical pain, unquote. For the calendar year 2019 proposed rule, we considered the recommendations of the commission as well as other stakeholders. We also conduct conducted our own internal data analysis, which showed that there was a decrease in the <coughs> utilization of non-opioid pain management drugs that are packaged under the drugs that function as a surgical supply policy in the Ambulatory Surgical Center, or ASC, during the time period of 2013 to 2017. We found increases in the utilization during the same time period for non-opioid pain management, management drugs that function as a supply in the OPPS setting. Based on this information for 2019, we are proposing to pay separately at average sales price, or ASP, plus 6% for non-opioid pain management drugs that function as a supply when used in a covered surgical procedure when the procedure is performed in an ASC. We stated in the calendar year 2019 OPPS ASC proposed rule that we believe this change, this proposed change will incentivize the use of non-opioid pain management drugs and is responsive to the commission's recommendation to examine payment policies for non-opioid pain management drugs that function as a supply with the overall goal of combating the current opioid addiction crisis. Currently, there's only one non-opioid pain management drug that is packaged under the drugs that function as a supply surgical policy that is payable under the LPPS or ASC payment systems. But to the extent that other non-opioid drugs that function as surgical supplies come onto the U.S. market, we are proposing that this policy would apply to them as well in 2019. We did not propose any changes to the OPPS packaging policy for drugs that function as a supply for 2019. However, we did solicit comments in the proposed rule on whether there may be evidence to suggest that separate payment under the OPPS may be appropriate for these drugs. We also sought comments regarding whether there are other non-opioid treatments for acute or chronic pain, including other drugs or devices that may be affected by OPPS and ASC packaging policies and warrant separate payment. And we are requesting evidence that such non-opioid alternatives lead to a reduction in opioid prescriptions and addiction. We also expressed interest in comments regarding whether we should provide separate payment for non-opioid pain management treatments using a mechanism such as an equitable payment adjustment under our authority at section 1833T2E of the Act which allows for adjustments as determined to be necessary to ensure equitable payments. We also express interest in comments on restructuring the APC structure for procedures involving non-opioid pain management treatments, such as by establishing more granular APC groupings for specific procedure and device combinations, to ensure that the payment rate for such services is aligned 
with the resources associated with the procedures involving specific devices, and whether that change would better achieve our goal of incentivizing increased use of non-opioid alternatives. That concludes my presentation. Thank you, Ms. Strong. Are there any questions for the presenters or for CMS staff in the panel? Dr. Manneker. Yeah, I've got a quick question. So I appreciate the overview of the prospective payment system from Ms. Strong and would appreciate any insights you two gentlemen could, could share with us for why this particular drug in this particular setting is different from the typical packaging. So other examples would be there's a epidemic of multi-drug resistant organisms. There's a variety of antibiotics that can be administered either prophylactically or therapeutically with a surgical procedure. Physicians get to choose cheaper, expensive antibiotic based on the clinical needs of the patient. Similarly, there's a variety of pressors on the market for anesthesia-induced hypotension, range of prices. Again, the anesthesiologist gets to pick which presser they use. A variety of non-opioid analgesics on the market increasing in use, as, as we just heard. What, what's different special about this drug as opposed to the other non-opioid analgesics, antibiotics, uh, uh, presser agents that, that would warrant uh, an exception to the prospective payment system? And if I could just make um, one clarification, which you did have in your slides, this drug is not available on the market. So let's speak specifically about this type of drug or whatever, because it's not available on the market currently. Right. Well, and that's a, a great point, Dr. Hamburg, because one of the most important things for this panel to take in mind is that under CMS's proposed rulemaking, they had an example of just one drug. And now the difference is that this is really a class of drugs. So we're not making a policy about just one drug that is already on the market. We have to also consider as policymakers what the future is and when we deal with a class of drugs. For antibiotics, for that example, there are antibiotics that are administered for prophylaxis that are, of course, part of the um, part of the procedure always. But there are other antibiotics that are separately billed and reimbursed at ASP plus six percent when used in the hospital outpatient department. So this policy and the effort to fight the opioid epidemic would treat the non-opioid uh, pain medication products as if they're separately billable, just like the other drugs under um, the hospital outpatient prospective payment system that are currently separately billable. And the other comment I would make is that a differentiating characteristic of a class of drugs that has a very long duration of action in analgesia is that it goes far beyond the actual surgical event. So even though this is given at the end of surgery, its impact is felt after surgery for days. So that would be equally true for drug-eluting stents and antibiotic impregnated devices and, and spacers for uh, infected joint replacements. Ms. Swagger. Hi. I also just want to remind the panel that um, the proposal that was included in the rule affects the one drug that's currently packaged because it functions as a surgical supply and it's related to um, non-opioid therapy. However, as, as Ms. Strong Holloway mentioned, there are um, to the extent that there are other drugs that come on the market that are similarly situated, the proposal would also apply to those drugs. In addition, under the, the drug pass-through policy, any new drug that comes to market that is not of insignificant cost, that is FDA approved, um, is eligible for pass-through payment, which is, allows separate payment um, based on the ASP plus 6% add-on methodology for a period not to exceed three years. So that policy does apply in the, while a drug or biological is on pass-through, it is not packaged. And then just to follow up, Ms. Swigert, so after two years of collecting data, including the pass-through payments, then that data is recalculated and adjusted throughout the APC schedule. Correct. Dr. Nolan. 
Yeah, I just had to clarify some of the technical information. If we were to pull out, whether it's drugs or any um, device treatments that would be an alternative, is that going to lower the payment? So, for example, in the ASC, would I expect to see lower payments for my surgical procedures if you're going to pay separately for one drug in comparison to the hospital setting? Is there a recalibration, I guess, because you're paying extra for one particular product? Hi, Tiffany Swigert. Um, to the extent that the drug that would get separate payment had previously been packaged and built into the procedure payment, the procedure payment under the OPPS would be recalibrated to remove those packaged costs. Um, while the, the payment to the surgery center is not within scope for the panel, um, because those payments to the ASCs are tied in large part to the payment under the OPPS, it would have an effect on that as well. Thank you. Um, if, can I further respond? Um, we did a um, analysis of the costs of the opioids that are, are being used as part of the surgery, and we estimated the cost is about $25 a procedure. So to the extent that that was, would be removed, it would be $25 less for the procedure on average. And, you know, obviously CMS would do the specific calculation, but just so you know in the grand scheme of things how much less it would be relative to the separate payment for the uh, non-opioid. So essentially what we're asking is to level the playing field so that for the physician, the choice is equal. Which should I use the opioid or should I use the non-opioid alternative, but then to hold the hospital outpatient department harmless regarding the payments. Any more questions from the panel? Any questions from the audience? Ms. Bate, are there any questions um, on the phone? Oh, I'm sorry. Now you, I know you know you're supposed to be at the mic <laughs> microphone. Now somebody else might be able to not do that, but you know. Thank you. I'm Jerry Stringham from Medical Technology Partners, and I think if um, I just wanted to comment that uh, to the extent CMS is um, talking about uh, relaxing packaging policies uh, for uh, non-opioid pain medications. It, should also be considered, as uh, Leela said, for devices. One such example would be uh, non-invasive uh, vagus nerve stimulation, which first such product was FDA approved late last year uh, for acute and chronic pain treatment. Uh, and uh, certainly there are published studies uh, for that type of product for, for uh, acute management of post-operative pain as well. So. Um, and would face similar um, obstacles and barriers that, uh, that uh, some of the pharmaceutical preparations that are under consideration are developing. So um, uh, I just wanted, wanted to voice support for, for uh, being as inclusive as possible uh, to the extent that we're going to um, move away from packaging um, of these types of products. Thanks. Thank you. Next. Hi, Valerie Wrinkle with Valorize Consulting. And I have a clarification question um, based on what uh, Ms. Swaggart uh, clarified. My understanding of the proposal on the table is to continue to package non-opiate um, drug servicing as a supply into the OPPS payment rate, but to separately recognize them in the ASC setting. But because ASC payments are tied to OPPS payments, if they stay packaged in the OPPS system, then doesn't that include cost in the ASC rate plus they would get ASP plus 6% for the non-opiates as well? So isn't that a form of kind of duplicate payment? It's a question that I have. Thank you, Ms. Wrinkle. Uh, we recognize that the ASC payment does include um, the OPPS relative weights, and so in, should that policy be finalized, the ASC payment would be recalibrated to ensure that there is no double payment. Um, and, and I do want to thank you for that clarification um, with respect to the proposal as it relates to the OPPS. Um, however, as, as Ms. Strong Holloway mentioned, the policy also solicit comments on whether there should be another alternative payment, um, such as using equitable adjustment authority 
um, or restructuring the APCs in a way to make them more granular um, to better recognize the cost of other non-opioid treatments, including not only drugs and biologicals, but also devices, um, to Mr. Stringham's comment. Okay. Thank you. Um, Ms. Bate, do we have anybody queued up on the phone? At this time, I don't see any questions. Thank you. Does the panel have a recommendation with respect to um, this presentation? Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, obviously, we'll come back at the end at various points to see if, if you do. All right. Let's go on to the... Thank you. Thank you. Let's go on to the next presentation. Um, it's about um, placement of a uh, specific code for benign prosthetic hyperplasia. Um, we're going to have an overview. I'm going to read it in order this time so I get it right from Captain Marjorie Baldo and um, Dr. John McGinnis. Welcome back. We'll be making a presentation found on page 18 of your booklet. First, we'll have the overview. Hi, everyone. I'm Marjorie Baldo, CMS staff in the Division of Outpatient Care. I'll provide a brief overview on the coding and payment for the resume procedure, which is also known as steam therapy or water vapor therapy for enlarged prostate. Currently, under the OPPS, the resume procedure is described by HEXPIX code C9748. This billing code is assigned to APC 5373, which is a level three urology APC with a payment rate of approximately $1,696. For your reference, slide two, which is up there, shows the current and predecessor billing codes along with the payment rates for the procedure from 2015 to 2018. This slide also shows a proposed payment for the procedure for 2019. By way of background, the system associated with the resume procedure is the resume system, which received FDA approval back in August of 2015. According to the FDA, the resume system is indicated to relieve symptoms obstructions, and reduced prostate tissue associated with benign prostatic hyperplasia, or BPH. It is indicated for men 50 years or older with prostate volume between 30 and 80 cubic centimeters. The resume system is also indicated for treatment of prostate with hyperplasia of the central zone and or a median lobe. In terms of the coding, according to the manufacturer, Nextera, which was acquired by Boston Scientific early this year, the resume procedure was originally billed using existing CPT code 53852. However, in September 2017, the AMA, the AMA CPT editorial panel stated that the resume procedure should not be reported with CPT code 53852. Instead, it should be reported with the unlisted code for the urinary system, specifically CPT code 53899. Slide two shows the long descriptors and payment rates for both codes. In September 2017, Nextera submitted a new technology application for the resume procedure. In January 2018, CMS established a C code for the procedure, specifically C9748, and assigned the code to APC 5373 with a payment rate of approximately $1,696. In early 2018, Nextera requested that CMS reconsider the APC assignment for the code from APC 5373 to APC 5375, which is a level five urology APC. CMS is currently reviewing the reconsideration request. For the 2019 update, the CPT editorial panel has established a new category one CPT code to describe the resume procedure, which will be effective January 1, 2019. In the 2019 OPPS and ASC proposed rule, we published a placeholder code and payment rate for the resume procedure, which is described by CPT code 53.8x3. As noted in slide two, we are proposing to assign placeholder code 53.8x3 to APC 53.73 with a payment rate of approximately $1,731. We note that this proposed APC is the same APC assignment for the current code C9748. In addition, as noted in slide two, which shows the status indicator of D next to the code, we are proposing to delete C9748 at the end of the year since it will be replaced with a category one CPT code. 
And finally, for the panel's reference, slide three shows the seven levels of urology APCs and the proposed 2019 payment rate for each APC. That concludes my overview on the coding and payment for the resume procedure. Thank you. Dr. McGinnis. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Marjorie. Uh, it was very helpful, and, and I'll try not to repeat uh, any of the information. So I'm John McGinnis, representing uh, Boston Scientific that manufactures the resume system. <coughs> That's who I am. Uh, so I, I will focus on uh, the new information. Uh, this information has been presented to CMS, and they know all about it. <coughs> and part of it comes from the physician fee schedule uh, payment system rule. Uh, but there's a new category one code and it's up there, 538X3, transurethral destruction of prostate tissue. Uh, there's two other codes that are highly similar and they're at the bottom uh, of this slide and they are the same up to the semicolon, 53850 and 53852, transurethral destruction of the of prostate tissue. The new code um, is radiofrequency generated water vapor thermotherapy. That's the resume system. The uh, five zero is the microwave uh, energy source and five two is the radio, direct radiofrequency uh, source. Marjorie went over uh, most of this, um, the system was approved by FDA in 2015. Uh, one thing of interest is it's a 510K, meaning that it has a predicate device, and the FDA determined that it was substantially equivalent to the device that is used in the code 53852, the radio frequency device. Uh, part of my work with Boston Scientific has been on the last bullet and currently all the Medicare administrative contractors in the United States cover resume um, under the miscellaneous code as reasonable and necessary for Medicare beneficiaries. This is a little bit of a review of the system. Um, the new code, uh, 538X3, 53850, and 53852 all have very similar systems. There's a generator uh, and a delivery device um, and in this case, what the generator does is it uses radio frequency heat to heat up the steam, and the steam is delivered um, uh, through the device labeled number two, and there's a fine needle that actually penetrates into the prostate tissue. Um, and so the, 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 the steam heat is delivered in a series of nine-second treatments, and that causes destruction and shrinkage of the prostate uh, tissue. So this is one of the really two uh, key slides um, of this presentation. So you look at this, for these three very similar procedures, um, of course the new code doesn't have a geometric mean cost. It won't until next year when there's data available for the C code that is effective now. Uh, 53850 has a geometric mean cost of almost $3,300 and is assigned to level four urology with a payment of uh, $2,700. In 53852, the payment just under, uh, I'm sorry, geometric mean cost of just under $3,000 is in level five. Um, so a couple things here, you know, you have 538X3 way down in level three. Question is why is that the case? And then you have 53850, um, in level four, even though it has a higher geometric mean cost than 53852, which is in level five. But anyway, both of the comparable codes are in higher levels of the urology APCs. This is information that comes from the uh, proposed rule for the physician fee schedule. A couple of notes down below. We all know that RVUs aren't used in OPPS rate setting. Uh, that's the case, but I wanted to show this non-facility practice expense RVUs and what the RUC recommended to CMS and then what CMS uh, accepted in terms of the RUC recommendations. And these non-facility PRVUs really represent a proxy or, or a comparison point for relativity 
of these procedures, one against the other. Um, and my argument is that this relativity should be preserved um, in the OPPS. You see here, all of these procedures were recently evaluated um, by the RUC because they're all very similar. They have uh, similar payments except the resume procedure is actually higher due to higher non-facility practice expense RVUs, which means that the cost of the equipment, supplies, et cetera, for the resume procedure is a little bit higher than these other procedures. Um, the physician office payment is higher. It's $1,800 versus about $1,600 or $1,500 for 53850 and 53852. But when you look over at the OPPS payment, uh, 53850 has a level four payment um, of almost $2,800, and then 53852, the level five, which is significantly higher. And then the um, uh, resume procedure that has higher practice expense RVUs um, has a significantly lower uh, OP OPPS payment. So the idea here is that one would expect that this relativity that has been recognized by the RUC and CMS in the physician fee schedule proposed rule would also be present um, in the uh, hospital outpatient setting. Um, so the level three, we believe, um, is an inappropriate assignment um, for the new code. And this is probably the best objective evidence we have um, for this. None of this came obviously from the manufacturer. So our request is that the panel recommend for the final rule that C CMS reassign the new code uh, to one of the APCs that the similar codes that the RUC reevaluated recently as a family, uh, either level four urology or level five urology. Now, the one thing that I will say is the slide says either level four or level five, and I've said the, this, this to CMS also. I could understand why CMS or the panel would be reluctant um, to recommend level five. Um, first of all, 53850 has a lower geometric mean cost, um, I'm sorry, a higher geometric mean cost than 53852, which is assigned to level five. That's a little bit of a question for CMS, whether they have those um, APC assignments right, but I think that all of the information when looked at collectively definitely supports the assignment of this new code at least to level four based on clinical comparability and resource similarity based on the relativity that was established through the RUC review and then CMS agreement uh, with that and publication of that information um, in the proposed rule for the physician fee schedule. The consequences of this is that uh, the new technology in a, in a critical period um, when, when uptake can, can suffer if, if reimbursement is inaccurate, uh, will be underpaid relative to these other procedures that are very similar um, and disadvantaged uh, in the marketplace. Um, thank you. Thank you, Dr. McGinnis. Are there any questions from any panel members? One here. Dr. Manneker. Thanks. Um, I've got one question to be preceded by, by one comment. Uh, while normally the physician fee schedule is uh, out of bounds for the panel, uh, since you've brought up the issue of relativity and the uh, practice expense RVUs, uh, I'd like to make a comment about that because I know a little about the practice expense RVUs. And um, most importantly, it's not really a relativity scale for PERVUs. The recommendations are actually the direct practice expense inputs, including the equipment, the clinical staff, and the supplies. So without knowing the exact details of the clinical staff times, the supplies, the equipment acquisition costs, including the amortization for the useful lifetime, et cetera. And then Consequently, the indirect practice expense RVUs, one, one can't make a direct comparison. And even if one were to make that type of a direct comparison, the, the PERVUs would, I, I say, would appear to me to warrant remaining in level three rather than level four because of where, where they fall in terms of the economics of it. 
1700 versus 1900. Um, the, the question that I, that I have is really regarding the clinical similarities. At, at the, the end of the day, there's a device administering some type of therapy to the prostate. And in level five, it's specifically delivering a radio frequency. In level four, it's delivering microwave. And theoretically, in level three, it would be delivering steam. And we've all heated up a cup of tea in our microwave in, in the kitchen to make some steam coming off. And sort of regardless of what device we're using at the end of the day, level five would seem to be delivering radio frequency to the tissue, level four delivering microwave to the tissue, and level three steam to the tissue. Uh, if it were to be placed in level five, it would potentially be creating a two times rule violation. Uh, and uh, it's substantially less than the payment in uh, level four when you add together the 99 APC payment along with the C code for the device. So it would seem to me that the, the placement in level three would be appropriate on the clinical context of delivering steam rather than radio frequency or microwave. Yeah, I guess, I mean, this, this sort of raises a, a question, um, and that's why I, you know, display this slide again. So, you know, with regard to the direct practice, the indirect practice expense inputs are going to be very similar because it's all urologists, it's all the same condition, it's all the same diagnosis, all, all of that is sort of constant. But here what you have is a fairly, for both the microwave and the direct radio frequency, very similar proposed physician fee schedule in-office non-facility payments and significantly higher proposed OPPS payments, which is typically what you see, meaning that the hospital outpatient setting is a higher cost site of service. Um, but here what you see for the, for 538X3 is the reverse. I mean, the physician fee, uh, the physician fee schedule is, is up at um, 1837, and the, and the OPPS payment is significantly lower, and that's not a pattern that is typical. I mean, I think that, I think that what the non-facility practice expense RVU show is that at a minimum, and here you have the, 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 the value being greater for 538X3, at a minimum, the costs of all of the, the sort of facility supplies uh, that go into what you would pay a hospital, not the physician professional fee, would be comparable, number one. Number two, I fully acknowledge, and I think there's a legitimate question as to whether any of these procedures are appropriate for level five, uh, 53852 has a lower geometric mean cost than 53850. So why is 53850 on level four and 53852 on level five? I, I, I don't know why that is the case. Um, but I think having this procedure down in level three uh, is, is based on clinical and resource similarity an inappropriate APC placement. I'll just, well, I'll just uh, confirm your um, statement that it's not typical to see that type of a reversal between the physician fee schedule and the outpatient payments. Uh, it, there is precedent for it, and uh, probably many people in the room will recall several years ago there were about a half dozen pathology review codes, several neurodiagnostic studies, and a couple of ENT procedures where that observation was made, the proposal was to reduce the physician fee schedule down, and uh, upon review, it was recognized that it was simply an artifact of some procedures given the two very different methods of how one calculates payments on the physician fee schedule rather than the hospital outpatient, pan, uh, hospital outpatient payments. And so, yes, while not typical, there, there is precedent for such uh, seemingly paradoxical observations. And in this case, I mean, what you have really is a very recent review of these codes that are very similar from the same clinical family by the RUC and by CMS. So this is, 
This is fresh information. The other thing that you have to remember about what they've done, what they're doing with this new code is the initial placement of a new code is based on a best guess. Uh, typically, they have some information from the manufacturer, but that's it. In addition, here, they have the added benefit of the RUC looking to the, at, at this and their um, colleagues over in the physician fee schedule. So what I would say is that in terms of there being kind of an anomaly, I think there's a couple of anomalies here. One is for the 538X3 having the physician office payments significantly higher than the OPPS is one thing, but also you've got 850 and 852 down at about 15 to $1,600. Uh, and then um, correspondingly significantly higher in the hospital outpatient. I have racked my brains, brain on that one and have no, no explanation whatsoever um, for that. Uh, and I mean, I, I, I don't, you know, I just ca kind of, I mean, I, that's sort of how it is. I, I don't. Okay, thank you, Dr. McGinnis. Ms. Swagger. Hi, I would just like to remind everyone that both the physician fee schedule and the OPPS are proposed rules. So all of the um, figures that you see on this slide that is presented right now are proposed. Um, I'll, I'll only speak to the OPPS proposed rules since that's the, the topic um, of discussion for today. Um, all of these codes and their APC placements are subject to the 60-day the public comment period as well as any recommendations that the panel may make today. Um, and to the extent that the panel believes that there is sort of an incongruent um, placement of, of certain codes, um, any of those are, are welcome to recommendations as well as public comments to be considered for the final rule. I will also remind the panel that the data that's used for the proposed rule is updated um, for the final rule. So some of the the geometric mean cost that you see, as well as what the payment rates would be, um, are not necessarily what was proposed. Um, in addition, just a reminder, which I, I think uh, Dr. McGinnis stated at the onset, um, and as well as Dr. Banneker, the physician fee schedule is a separate uh, entity payment system and um, is not within scope for the panel, um, as Dr. Hambrick mentioned as well. Any other questions for, um, from the audience? Ms. Bate, um, are there any, anybody queued up on the line? At the moment, I do not see any questions. Okay, thank you very much. Panel, are there any recommendations with respect to this um, presentation? Okay, thank you, Dr. McGinnis. Next up will not be a break because it's not 1110. Uh, we will move on to a proposal for um, comprehensive APC for autologous hem hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. As I understand it, there may be an additional um, presenter um, from the National Marrow Donor Program, but I will let them introduce themselves. The, we're going to have an overview from Ms. Leela Strong. I'll put Holloway on there. They didn't. You know, <laughs> tell me to update the thing, but I'll, I'll say Holloway. Thank you. Uh huh. And um, followed by a public presentation from Ms. Jugna Shaw and I believe Ms. Susan Lepke, but I'll let them introduce themselves um, when they do their presentation. The public presentation is on page 27. Ms. Hello. Strong. Again, my name is Leela Strong Holloway. I'll be giving an overview of autologous hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, which is represented by CPT code 38241. CPT code 38241 was established by the AMA CPT editorial panel in 1999. This CPT code is used to report an autologous transplant of hematopoietic stem cells. The hospital bills and shows all charges for autologous stem cell harvesting processing, and transplant procedures when the services are furnished. Autologous hematopoietic stem cell transplants, or HSCT, involve the transplantation of stem cells that are collected from the recipient. The procedure codes describing autologous stem cell harvesting as well as stem cell processing procedures may be billed and are separately payable under the OPPS. 
In the 2018 OPPS ACS ASC final rule, CPT code 38241 was assigned to APC 5242, which is level two blood product exchange and related services with a payment rate of approximately $1,222. The geometric mean cost for 5242 is approximately $1,221. The geometric mean cost for CPT code 38241 based on 23 single claims of 378 total claims is approximately $1,764. For 2018, CPT code 38241 is assigned to status indicator S which indicates that this code is separately paid under the OPPS. For the calendar year 2019 OPPS and ASC proposed rule, CPT code 38241 is assigned to APC 5242 as well, level two blood product exchange and related services with a proposed payment rate of approximately $1,223. The geometric mean cost for APC 5242 is approximately $1,245. The geometric mean cost for CPT code 38241 based on 14 single claims of 379 total claims is $1,270. This represents a decrease in the number of single claims from 2018 of approximately 39% and a decrease in the GM mean costs for CPT code 38241 from 2018 of approximately 28%. For calendar year 2019, CPT code 38241 is also proposed to be assigned to status indicator S, which indicates that the code is separately paid under the OPPS. In contrast to autologous hematopoietic stem cell transplants, that harvest stem cells from the recipient, allogeneic HSCT involves the intravenous infusion of hematopoietic stem cells from a donor to a recipient. There are several donor acquisition costs associated with an allogeneic HSCT, which may include national marrow donor program fees, tissue typing of donor and recipient, donor eva evaluation, physician donor evaluation services, and stem cell collection and processing procedures. Allogeneic HSCT donor acquisition costs, including stem cell harvesting and processing, cannot be paid separately under the OPPS because hospital bills may, hospitals may bill and receive payment only for services that are provided to a Medicare beneficiary who is the recipient of the HSCT and whose illness is being treated with the transplant. Historically, donor acquisition costs have been packaged into the APC for the APC payment for the allogeneic HSCT when the transplant occurs in the hospital outpatient setting. In the calendar year 2017 OPPS ASC final rule, we finalized a comprehensive APC, or CAPC, for allogeneic hematopoietic stem cell transplants. CAPC 5244, level four, blood product exchange and related services. CPT code 38240, hematopoietic progenitor cell allogeneic transplantation donor is the only procedure assigned to CAPC 5244. The purpose of creating this CAPC in 2017 was to ensure accurate payment for the allogeneic HSCT procedure, including the donor acquisition costs. The CAPC policy packages payment for adjunctive services into the primary service at the claim level. The payment for all donor acquisition services for allogeneic HSCT is packaged into the CAPC payment for the allogeneic stem cell transplant when the transplant occurs in the hospital outpatient setting. These costs are also analyzed using our comprehensive cost accounting methodology to establish future CAPC payment rates. The geometric mean cost associated with the allogeneic HSCT procedure was approximately $6,795 in 2016 prior to the creation of CAPC 5244. 
Since 2017, the geometric mean cost for the allogeneic HSCT procedure has increased by 284% to approximately $26,117 in the calendar year 2019 proposed rule. The payment rate for allogeneic HSCT has increased from approximately $3,000 in the calendar year 2016 rule to a proposed payment rate of approximately $25,645 for 2019. This includes my data overview for CPT code 38241. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Susan Lepke and I am the Director of Public and Payer Policy at the National Marrow Donor Program, Be The Match, and I have no financial disclosures. With me today is Ms. Jugna Shaw from Nimit Consulting, who we pay for her work on our behalf. The National Marrow Donor Program, Be The Match, manages the largest and most diverse marrow registry in the world through a competed contract by the, that's overseen by the Health Resources and Services Administration. In addition to finding life-saving matches for patients with blood cancers and other blood disorders, assisting with third-party, excuse me, third-payer matters is a core function of the Office of Patient Advocacy, which is one of the contracts overseen by HRSA, and as outlined by Congress in our authorizing statute. The health policy team focuses on removing financial barriers to patients and increasing access to care. In our work, we advocate for over 180 hospitals across the country and provide extensive education on appropriate coding, reimbursement, and coverage of transplant. We would like to thank CMS and the HOP panel for its hard work over the past few years on a number of coding, data collection, and reimbursement issues related to stem cell transplants. We were especially pleased to see the CMS introduce the comprehensive APC for allogeneic stem cell transplant in calendar year 2017 and believe a similar strategy should be pursued for autologous transplant. To that end, our presentation today is focused on CPT code 38241 for autologous stem cell transplant assigned to APC 5242 with a proposed calendar year 2019 payment of $1,223. We believe it would be appropriate for CMS to study the creation of a CAPC for autologous transplant similar to its decision to create a CAPC for allogeneic transplant. I'd now like to turn it over to Ms. Shaw to describe the issue further. Good morning. So um, Ms. Strong did a great job of articulating the reason why we had asked for a comprehensive APC for allogeneic transplant a few years ago. And just to illustrate to the panel, the, the reason that we're coming back is for CAPC for autologous is not for the same reasons as allogeneic. So we're asking for a CAPC for auto, um, partly because we end up studying the issues of allo and auto. And in looking at the claims data for autologous transplant, um, as Ms. Strong said, only 14 single procedure claims were used. Um, and I appreciated her sharing that that was a 39% decrease from a previous year. We had not looked at that. So our point is that very few claims are used, and that's because there's lots of services that are packaged, whether they're the status N services that are always packaged or the Q1, the Q series um, injections or infusions, um, other ancillary services, as CMS has increased ancillary packaging over the years, more and more of those things are done on the same day as the autologous transplant. And so then very few claims would be by nature a single procedure claim or a pseudo single. So the appropriate picture of the services that are delivered to an autologous transplant case those claims are set aside and not used for rate setting. So we would ask that CMS study, as Ms. Lepke said, that CMS would study creating a comprehensive APC for autologous transplant. We feel like that is very much in line with CMS's movement towards increasing comprehensive APCs where appropriate, and as Ms. Swigert pointed out um, in her opening remarks, um, this, you know, CMS is continuously trying to move away from fee schedule into larger bundles of payment were appropriate and we think this would be a place that it would be appropriate for CMS to study it. We are by no means asking that the autologous would be placed in the allogeneic. That would not be appropriate. Um, we 
probably think it would have its own CAPC. We have not been able to do the full data analysis to determine um, placement, but I don't think there would be an existing APC that would meet the clinical and resource homogeneity principles of the OPPS. So we're asking that the hot panel recommend to CMS that it study creating a comprehensive APC, comprehensive APC for autologous stem cell transplant um, because we believe there are many ancillary adjunctive related services provided on the same day as the auto transplant. Thank you. Thanks. Are there any questions for the presenters? Dr. Manica. All right. So I've got um, just just one question. Uh, I, I appreciate the request being to study the the issue. Um, all the acquisition costs are theoretically billable by appropriate CPT codes and APC assignments. So the 39 percent reduction in costs that was observed in the data. Um, do you do you believe that is because there are services being rendered that are not being reported? And if so, what, what services would those be? How could we find them and study them if they're not in the claims data? And why do you prefer that explanation rather than the explanation that everyone's trying to cut costs, be more efficient, and the costs have just gone down because there's more of these being done? and people are more efficient at it. So I, maybe there's a clarifying question. I'm not sure if I misheard. I thought Ms. Strong said that there was a 39% decrease in single procedure claims. Uh, yes. right. Is that yes. what you said? Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I yep. misinterpreted that. So I think that's, so I think our point um, is very much in line with, with what's being said. If you have, so you have fewer single procedure claims, right, because there's, if you have two separately payable services um, and you have package services, then you can't use that claim. CMS can't use that claim. So what we're saying is on a day that there's an autologous transplant, there very much could be um, thawing of the cells. There's blood typing, there's um, injection or infusion, sometimes transfusion. We're trying to analyze the 379 claims against, you know, those are the full universe of claims versus the 14 that were used for rate setting and all the ones that were set aside. And what we see is typically, and the clinicians have confirmed it, you have a whole series of services. Um, and, and you're right, CMS is correct, that many of those are separately payable. So it's not about what's paid real time. The issue then is those very claims are used for rate setting two years later, and only the claims with very few things on them get used for rate setting. And are you aware of any change in the demographics such that more, or more autologous are being done in non-Medicare beneficiaries and uh, autologous is being done more commonly in Medicare? Uh, another explanation for the potential decrease? So I, I, I don't think the decrease in the number of single procedure claims is related at all to sort Not of who's getting transplant. I think it's what services are provided on the same day. And so as there's more stuff that CMS packages, right, by default there'll be more packaged items and services on the same day with separately payable services. So I think what, I, I think your question's a good one. I mean, I think we are seeing more autologous transplant um, in general in the outpatient setting. Yeah. But that doesn't change the nature of the individual services that have to be rendered to deliver the full auto transplant. So it's really an artifact of the CMS payment system. As you package more stuff, there's more packaged stuff on a cl claim that renders them unusable for rate setting. So not that anybody asked me a question, but I just sort of have a question. Um, Edith Hambrick, for those on the phone. Um, so they are separately payable. Have you all looked at whether those separately payable services are going up or down so that potentially the total cost you know, payment could be the same or higher? or lower, um, but I just, you know, throw that out since, you, since it's a study question, yeah. you know, um, maybe when you come back next year with your study, you could enlighten <laughs> us as to how, how all of those interact because just be, obviously it could be that 
um, the specific code is falling, but the other separately payable services, not even attributable to you, but attributable to all those other separately thawing, freezing, whatever you're talking about, could be going up. So, but just later on for your study purposes. Okay, that was it, because I'm sure given some other comments we're going to hear later, you haven't had a chance to analyze that, <laughs> given when the rule came out. We've done, Dr. Emmerich, we've done a very cursory analysis, which is why we didn't, we didn't want to include it in the material. We want to refine it. I think that from a payment perspective, the comprehensive payment would probably be in the neighborhood of about $5,000. Um, so it would be higher than the 1200 or some today, but as you point out, today, providers wouldn't just get 1200 they'd get the 1200 plus certain separately payable services, um, but they won't get separate payment for all the different services. So certainly the comprehensive APC, we would say, would pay more appropriately for all the different services rendered, and then would also enable CMS to use 100% of the claims for future rate setting. Okay, thanks. Any other questions from panel members? Okay, Ms. Spate, any, oh, sorry, there's no Nola. questions. Oh. No, um, no Ms. Questions. Bate, any questions? Anybody queued up on the phone? There are no questions, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Dr. Manneker? Yeah, uh, so I would make a motion that we do, in fact, study this and try and figure out what, if anything, is missing and whether there would be value in creating a comprehensive APC. Second. Yeah. Any discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Okay, thanks. All right, now it is close to 11.10, and I don't know what the real time is. 11.14. 11.14, so everybody be back at 11.30, so we can take up um, our chimeric antigen receptor on the nose, 11.30. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Good, good second part of the morning. Can't say good afternoon. Good second part of the morning. This is Edith Hambrick, and we're back live with the um, advisory panel on hospital outpatient payment. Um, I'd just like to welcome everybody back and also to um, um, say that we apparently have some people who maybe wanted to speak earlier on some of the earlier presentations on the line and um, were not able to. So what we're going to do first, um, Ms. Spate is going to give instructions about how to queue up to make a comment about previous presentations that you still want to make comments about. And then we'll have a few minutes for those to be done. And I hope the speakers are still in the auditorium, we'll soon find out, um, if, in case there's something that was going to be directed at the speaker. Um, so, Ms. Spate, if you could um, make the announcement and how they can queue up, and then we'll see if there are any, presentation, any questions or comments about presentations that were made up to this point. Yes, hello, everyone. Um, if you want to have any questions, I'm going to unmute all of the lines. If you are not asking questions at the time, could you please put your phone line on mute? Um, those who will be asking questions, um, we will unmute all of the lines, okay? So are there any questions on any presentations prior to now and then First up, whoever speaks first, you get to make your comment or question. I thought there was somebody from one of the later presentations that had a problem getting in earlier. The lines have been unmuted now. If you are, have any questions, feel free to ask. Okay, I'm not hearing any. One more chance. There's, some, there's, some, there's some voice. Which oh, I can't hear. okay. 
Um, we're hearing something. It could be background noise, but if you're speaking, please speak a little bit louder, close to the phone. Okay. Best to me too. Miss Fate, um, if you can um, mute all the lines and then whoever else would like to make a comment where there will be another or question, there will be another opportunity at the end for you to make a comment. Okay. So um, now let's move on to chimeric antigen receptor T cell therapy code status indicators. We're going to have an overview from Mr. Josh McFeeters and a public presentation from Ms. Jugna Shaw and Ms. Stephanie Farnia. You come to the um, table. Um, page 36 is the presentation. Dr. Hambrick, yes. uh, I'm going to recuse myself from this discussion because my institution has a financial relationship with one of the two products being discussed. Uh, I'll, I'll be here in the audience if there's uh, points of information or uh, clarifications people would, from the panel would like to ask me. Thank you, Dr. Manneker. Mr. McPheeters? Thank you, Dr. Hambrick. Okay, I'm going to give some background on the CART-T treatment, uh, or therapy, I should say. Uh, chimeric antigen receptor CAR-T cell therapy is a cell-based gene therapy in which T cells are genetically engineered to express a chimeric antigen receptor that will bind to a certain protein on a patient's cancerous cells. The CAR-T cells are then administered to the patient to attack certain cancerous cells and the individual is observed for potential serious side effects that would require medical intervention. Two CAR T cell therapies received FDA approval in 2017. Chimera, manufactured by Novartis Pharmaceuticals Corporation, was approved for the use in the treatment of patients up to 25 years of age with B cell precursor acute lympho lymphoblastic leuke leukemia, ALL, that is refractory or in second or later relapse. In May 2018, Camraya received FDA approval for a second indication, treatment of adult patients with relapsed or refractory large B cell lymphoma after two or more lines of systematic therapy, including diffuse large B cell lymphoma, DLBCL, high grade B cell lymphoma, and DLBCL arising from follicular lymphoma. Yescarta, manufactured by Kite Pharma Incorporated, was, was approved for use in the treatment of adult patients with relapsed or refractory large B cell lymphoma who have not responded to or have relapsed after at least two other kinds of treatment. Now we're going to talk about the HixPix codes for CAR T. The HixPix coding for the currently approved CAR T therapies include, include leukothoresis, leukophoresis, and dose preparation procedures, since these services are included in the manufacturing of these biologicals. The HixPix code for CAR-T Chimera has been active since January 1, 2018 in the OPPS and received OPPS transitional pass-through status on April 1, 2018. Chimera is separately paid and is a status indicator of G. The HixPix code for the CAR-T therapy for Yescarta has been active since April 1, 2018. Yescarta also has transitional pass-through status in the OPPS since April 1, 2018 it is separately paid and is a status indicator of G. The transitional pass-through payment for Camraya and Yescarta is currently based on the average sale price, or ASP, plus 6%. For example, Camraya is paid at a rate of approximately $500,000. This includes a 6% add-on amount of approximately $30,000. So unlike traditional anti-cancer therapies that are manufactured and sold by a biopharmaceutical company, and then purchased by and dispensed from a pharmacy, a multi-step process is used to produce CAR-T. However, the existing CAR-T therapies on the market were approved as biologicals, and thus under current Medicare OPPS policy, payment for CAR-T is made under the authority of Medicare law for Part B drugs and biologicals. In addition, Medicare does not generally pay drug manufacturers separately for each step used to manufacture a drug or biological. The codes in question in the presentation uh, from, from Nimit Consulting and the, uh, and, and, and the, and the blood uh, was ASBMT. Um, 
uh, and cover the following codes in question, which are now displayed on the screen. The first code is 05X1T, which is a pre-infusion category three code, which describes chimeric antigen receptor T cell uh, CAR -T, T therapy, the harvesting of blood-derived T lymphocytes for the development of genetically modified autologicus CAR T cells per day. Code um, 05X2T, which is going to be a pre-infusion category three code, which describes chimeric antigen receptor T cell CAR T therapy, preparation of blood derived T lymphocytes for transportation. Example cryopreservation and storage. Then you have code 05X3T, a pre infusion category 3 code, which describes chimeric antigen receptor T cell CAR T therapy, receipt and preparation of CAR T cells for administration. The final code in question in the presentation today is 05X4T which is also category three code, which describes chimeric antigen receptor T cell uh, therapy, CAR T administration autologicus. In the CY 2019 LPPS proposed rule, we propose that each of the above category three CPT codes will be assigned to a status indicator of B, as in boy, which means that the procedure codes are not recognized by the OPPS when submitted on an outpatient hospital part B bill type. I will note that combining services under one HICS-PICS code also reduces patient liability as co-payments under the OPPS are capped at the level of, in, of the inpatient hospital deductible, which is $1,340 for calendar year 2018. And finally, I wanted to show you what we have here for Kimraya and Yes Carta. These are the official HICS-PICS codes. Uh, the codes there list as Q2040 and Q2041. We also have the FDA approval dates, the dates they receive pass-through status, and their long descriptor, um, which you can see includes the leukophoresis and the dose preparation, and also their cost, a proposed cost uh, for uh, CY 2019. And this concludes my presentation. Thank you. Ms. Shaw, you're by yourself. Dr. Hambrick, Stephanie Farnia from the ASBMT is on the phone line. Oh, So okay. if there are questions um, that she could answer specifically, we could do that or she can text me or something. So. Okay. Okay, so thank you so much. Um, I'm here on behalf of the ASBMT making the presentation today. As I mentioned, Stephanie Farnia, the policy director of the ASBMT is on the line. Um, the CPT codes have already been presented. Um, these are the new category three CPT codes that the um, ASBMT and additional organizations uh, went to the AMA to request because there are no um, CPT codes available today to describe um, the different services that the hospital renders. Um, and, and that presentation was made in May and the AMA um, approved these codes that you see. I won't step through the description of the therapy um, as that was done very well already. I will just orient the panel um, to the last bullet point on the slide. Per AMA instruction, and this is really relevant today, you're not supposed to use a CPT code that just approximates a service if there's no better code to use. You're supposed to use the unlisted code, which is what people have been doing since the FDA approval of the therapy. So people are using um, 38999 as the unlisted CPT code at present. Um, our concern is, so, so while it is true that the product Q codes do exist and those codes have embedded in them collection and some of the preparatory work, um, as CMS staff and many um, are aware, the Q codes are not what people would generally like to see and they would like to see the Q codes change to J code so that the drug is just about the drug and patient care services rendered by the hospital would be um, separately reportable, i.e. the collection of the cells, the preparation for sending them out, getting them back, and then most importantly, the infusion, the administration of the CAR T cells. There's no way to report those things, and so that's why the AMA was um, requested to release the codes. So there is a, a natural tension. I absolutely will, will agree that there's a little bit of a tension between the existing Q code for these products um, and, and some of the release of the codes that have occurred. I would like to just call out um, some examples of where uh, th this is problematic. So the payment rates that, that CMS presented 
were for the actual CAR-T for the product itself. And most patients, certainly the Medicare lymphoma patients that we're talking about today, those patients are not treated. They are not getting this therapy in the outpatient setting. Now, that is likely to change in time. Um, a few centers may be doing it outpatient, but in general, it's not. So the infusion occurs typically in the inpatient setting, but the cells are collected in the outpatient setting. So a patient comes to the um, institution, they're registered as an outpatient, their cells are collected, um, cell processing happens, they're shipped out. Those services are not being um, captured because of this tension between the Q code, um, which is not appropriate to report in the outpatient setting. Um, that's a natural tension. So first and foremost, cells are collected in the outpatient setting. Hospital really needs to be able to bill a CPT service to indicate, hey, this is the work that I did for this registered patient. The payment policy part, one could talk about separately, but the service can't be reported. The other situation is certainly if the CART-T is infused in the outpatient setting, today people would report 38999, presumably January 1st, they would report this new code. It's a better, more appropriate code. Finally, there are situations where hospital A or provider A would do the cell collection and then a different provider would do the infusion. And so again, the current Q codes create some complexity around um, how to be able to report these services. So um, the ASBMT respectfully requests the HOT panel to recommend to CMS that it change the status indicators to these new category three CPT codes for CAR-T services from status B, which we, um, in the coding world, sort of euphemistically talk about, hey, go find a better code. We don't really know what the better code would be, um, especially for the infusion of the CAR-T cells. Um, so these are new codes representing new services. We believe it would be appropriate to crosswalk these at the moment to the transplant APCs um, until we have better data. So we've provided that crosswalk to say 38206 is the collection of auto cells while CAR-T is different. That's sort of the most natural kind of fit at the moment. Same with some of the preparation and then the administration. Um, and I can happily provide more information if the panel so needs, but this is sort of our, our recommendation for at least assigning these codes, um, status indicators, so that hospitals are able to report these services when they're rendered. Um, and, and the appropriate payment rates for now. We certainly recognize that as data comes in, CMS would evaluate and make additional changes. Um, our understanding is certainly that the OPPS payment system is designed um, you know, to provide um, certainly reporting and then separate payment where applicable for outpatients that are registered outpatients of the hospital where individual claims are submitted, and we believe these are the most clinically appropriate codes to represent the services. The expected outcome, of course, is better data and good coding and hospitals being able to separately report these services when they are actually rendered. And our worry if this is not done is, as, as this is a very new therapy, as everyone's aware, it's really important to get the coding correct in terms of the different services that are rendered to the patients, the collection of the cells, the preparatory procedures, and then certainly the infusion of the cells. So we feel very strongly that, at least from a um, data collection perspective and to be able to get that data so you understand what services are being rendered to these patients, aside from just the product Q code, that it's important to be able to have the um, hospitals report these services when rendered to their patients. Thank you. Yes, Ms. Wagner. And Ms. Shaw, could you go into a little bit more detail about the last bullet that you have there with respect to the existing um, Q codes? Um, and how that relates to your recommendation for separate payment for the new Category 1 CPT code. So are, are you suggesting that if the panel were to recommend separate payment for the CPT codes, that the, Q, the existing Q codes be revised to remove um, things such as the leukapheresis and dose preparation procedures? And can you just speak to that? Sure, thank you so much for the question. Um, so. Yes, in short, absolutely, um, to Ms. Swaggart's point, if the CPT codes were to receive separately the separate payment status indicators and separate APC payment, certainly 
the Q code should be revised to remove those elements and essentially be for the product or the drug, the living drug. People call it all different things, but essentially for the, the, the cellular therapy, that drug. The Hicks-Pix meeting in May, I believe it was, um, had a lineup of um, providers. Um, ASBMT made comments there. The, both of the two manufacturers were present. And I think, I don't want to speak too much out of turn, but I believe if we looked at those minutes, it was almost a unanimous um, showing that the Q code should be revised to J codes, have the pass-through status as it is, and remove the cell collection, which is a patient service, the preparatory procedures, remove those elements, um, and, and let the hospitals be able to report those services as they render them. There's, there's a huge sort of time gap that happens as well, in terms of when collection happens versus infusion. Sometimes, unfortunately, patients expire. Um, and so hospitals are really stuck with how are we supposed to report all this. It would, it would go a long way if the Q codes could be changed to J codes and then these CPT codes could have the payable status indicators. And thank you, Ms. Shaw, for the clarification. Just one further point of clarification, and that is that the um, OPPS does not have jurisdiction over J codes, so I just want to make that clear for the panel. Are there any? Uh, yes, Ms. Hard. So right now, from a coding aspect, there's no way to capture when you take these cells from a patient. They come in and take those. The hospital has to report an unlisted, so there's no way to gather the data. Is that the main issue that we're looking at? So that is, so I think there's, I think there are two issues. One, you're absolutely correct. Um, the ASBMT on their website has, has tried to prepare a crosswalk or a coding grid, so to speak, so that at least there's less confusion today, but yes, the, today that crosswalk would show to use 38999 for the collection of the cells. So we can't gather data on how often this is actually done because there's no specific way for the hospital to capture that. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from the panel? I, oh, sorry, Dr. Nolan? Yeah, could, um, I just ask a couple. Um, you mentioned a couple of a little closer. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You mentioned a few examples here, and I know we have less than a year of experience with the drugs, but do you have a percentage or number, or maybe Scott with his experience could chime in, the number of times that the leukapheresis is done at one location and then the CAR T is actually infused at a secondary location? Do you know, is that common? So it's not common, as far as I know. We've had a couple of people, a couple of sites that have said that they've done the collection um, and then it's sent off to the site, to the manufacturing site, and then it's come back and then a different institution would do the infusion. I don't think it's very common, though. So technically, Hospital 1 bills nothing, Hospital 2 gets paid for because it's included in the Q codes now, is that? Kind of, right. But then the Q code, remember that most of these are happening, um, as you point out, first of all, there's so few, it's just very, very new. But, but the infusion would occur inpatient, right? So whichever hospital does it, the infusion is inpatient. The Q code has no bearing in terms of being reported on the inpatient claim, nor does the hospital get that 500,000 or 300 and something thousand payment. So, so right. that's not payable, and I think the question is, does Hospital A then do a purchased service agreement right. with Hospital B for the collection? There's all kinds of questions. And do we know from our experience how many patients maybe die between the leukapheresis and the product being returned, or the manufacturer can't make the product? Is there, is it 10 percent or 20 percent, or? So I know Stephanie's on the line. Maybe she'll text me the answer or, or chime in, or if the manufacturers know. I don't know percentages sort of in total. I can tell you anecdotally from working with a few institutions, certainly out of, um, okay, here we go. Is it okay if I read her text? She says 10 um, percent or less. Okay. She would say, Stephanie Farnia would say 10% or less, where um, I think that is about the patients dying. But certainly we've had individual centers that have had patients die. Mm -hmm. um, so it, that's absolutely happening. But she says 10% or less so far. Okay, and then I have maybe, I don't know who could answer it best, but I think you had referenced the beneficiary cost being capped at the inpatient rate. So if we break these out and they're put on outpatient claims, will the beneficiary then have to pay additional co-pays on those outpatients? So it will actually increase the total amount the beneficiary has to pay? So 
So under the OPPS, beneficiary cost sharing is capped um, per service at the inpatient deductible. So with the current construct of the, the codes for Kim Raya and Yaskarta, um, that includes certain services that Ms. Shaw mentioned. Um, the copay for that is capped at the inpatient deductible, which is around $1,300. Um, to the extent that there are other separately payable services on an outpatient claim, that kind of renews the ability to, to charge cost sharing to the beneficiary, all capped individually at the inpatient deductible amount for that relevant year. So let me, let me make sure I understood what you just said. So if they come in for the leukapheresis and we're going to pay that claim separately, the beneficiary is going to have to pay for that extra, potentially. Correct, and unless there's a, a comprehensive methodology where all the services are, are paid sort of as a single encounter, that's correct. Okay, thank you. So just one comment about the inpatient, which of course they're not here to speak for themselves and of course they haven't read the final, but certainly <laughs> they included in the proposed, which I do remember, um, something about this and how they would be paid. So it's not quite true that if, they, if it's delivered on the inpatient that the hospital will get nothing. I don't know exactly what they finalized, but they're gonna get something for the payment um, of the drug procedure, whatever it is. But I must admit, I didn't read the final. Okay, any more comments from the panel directly for Ms. Shaw? If not, we'll go to the um, comments from the audience. Hello, I'm Kathy Norbosch. I'm representing the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. As a health system providing CAR-T therapy services, I've been fortunate enough to witness the outcomes of this life-changing treatment. Although we were disappointed that CMS did not address fully address payment challenges in the inpatient setting, there is some opportunity on the outpatient setting. I urge CMS to reconsider the status indicators as presented in order for facilities to be able to charge and be paid for each step along the way as they are happening in different settings of care. In addition, um, we will also then be able to have um, claims data for future rate setting and clearly identify what was being done with these very specific codes. So again, I support the presentation to change the status indicators and make these separately payable services. Thank you. Thank you. Settlement. Hi, I'm John Settlemeyer with Atrium Health, formerly uh, Carolina's Healthcare System, and home to Levine Cancer Institute. And as um, one of the facilities that is a CAR T provider, I just want to corroborate what Ms. Shaw said. And I was one of the stakeholders that participated in the Hicks Picks public meeting. Um, so, pretty much unanimously, all of the stakeholders did ask for the dose prep and the leukapheresis to be extracted from that definition. Um, and in fact, um, both Novartis and Kite were supportive of that. So, I mean, I think that I would personally like to see the drug itself be coded with a J code. I know that's not under the purview here, but, um, but I uh, fully support this request to uh, properly assign uh, the new category three CPT codes to an appropriate APC so that we can report them separately. Thanks. Thank you. Ms. Rankle. Hi, Valerie Wrinkle with Valorize Consulting. So I just wanted to um, make a comment. I'm fully in support of for correct coding and for data, data gathering on claims that each of these category three CPT codes be recognized with a status indicator that communicates to hospitals that they should report them on the individual claims as they occur. Outpatient claim for the leukophoresis, the cell processing that occurs by the hospitals. And I want to make a correction that it is not true that the manufacturer's cost includes the collection of the cells and the cell processing done by the hospital prior to shipping to the manufacturer. That is not the case. There is one manufacturer, not both, who has made a provision for that. But in interest of the president's interest in reducing prices for drugs and understanding the price transparency for drugs, hospitals are very uncomfortable typically, to contract with a manufacturer to be paid a separate amount 
for the cell collection that feels uncomfortable and it can mask the amount of cost. You saw in the presentation that the cost of the leukophoresis when performed for stem cell transplants is about $1,200. It's not extraordinarily expensive. And the number of times that this is gonna occur is very limited. So I think it's very important for the interest of price transparency for drugs to be very clear that the payment associated with the drug just include the manufacturing for the drug itself and not the hospital services reflective of the leukophoresis and the processing and certainly not the administration of the cells, which has not been addressed at all. That absolutely should be reported with its own unique now specific code beginning January 1. Thank you. Um, Ms. Bate, any comments from the um, phone? At this time, the lines are unmuted. Okay. Any, again, any comments from folks on, or com questions from people on the phone? Hi, this is Stephanie Farnier from the ASBMT. Can you hear me? Yes. Great, thank you. Um, it, obviously, we were the, the folks who submitted this presentation. Thank you very much for the time and, and energy in discussing it. I think the only comment I'd like to make further is, as uh, Ms. Wrinkle just previously said, I, the, the vast feedback from the provider community has been that the way that CAR-T is currently being handled with um, the Q code, and I know that's not the primary discussion here, but it was brought up in the opening comments in terms of the context of where these Category 3 codes are being discussed, is that you know that set of codes and the practices around CAR-T are, are different than every other clinical service they provide, as well as any other drug they provide, which is really causing a tremendous amount of, of confusion, of compliance concern, and of um, rework within the systems trying to make these exceptions work. And a large part of, that, part of that seems to be due to the very first product being the exception to the rule based on um, the next products that have come to market and those that are expected to come soon and the models that they will have in place. So we really feel like this is an opportunity for mm -hmm the panel to recommend clarity and the return to the usual practices that are normally in place for the kinds of uh, coding and billing practices that providers and hospitals use for the services that they provide. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from the phone? Thank you, Ms. Bate. Uh, Dr. Nolan? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to clarify. I don't see the public meeting minutes posted yet from the May meetings, but since we have provisions. Hey, we have in place on Earth. It's 9 a.m. I got a schedule every minute, Mark, it's 9 p.m. Pay attention and stay close. So, Ms. Bate, can you mute everyone for now? And then if somebody's, be, I'll ask Dinner again. reservation. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, the prevention code, I think it's Q2043, we've had since 2011, 2012, and it's similarly structured, so it includes the leukophoresis, those preparation, the manufacturer, and all of, all of the stuff. Um, and I don't remember that being an issue. I think the payment is about $40,000, so maybe it's a, 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 a payment issue as opposed to a, a policy issue. Um, I don't see the minutes posted, so the commenters that were at the public meeting agenda, did you also recommend that the policy be changed so that Prevenge also have those pulled, be pulled out and that these codes be used for that preparation as well? So um, we did not address the Provenge code at that meeting, but certainly I think CMS policy staff would probably try to make some consistency. Um, there's a, and happy to talk about it if, if it's appropriate, and, and there are others in the room that can speak to it. That model in terms of um, sort of how things happen and who contracts with whom and where things are collected and where they go, it's a completely different model and flow than what we're dealing with here. And so I, I think, and I don't want to be out of line here, but I think that perhaps when the manufacturer, one of them maybe had conversations early on um, with agency staff, maybe it was easy or it seemed like that model would work. But it, in time, I think everyone has come to realize that that model actually doesn't fit how CAR-T therapy 
works in terms of who does the cell collection, where things are happening, who's contracted and who's not. So I think it was really just a, it, 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 it's as Stephanie Farney has said, this was the exception um, and, and probably was just not the best model to follow. So I appreciate your comments as opinion, but as to what happened with ProVenge and the, and you probably have talked to manufacturers and so forth and so on, but to represent exactly what they may be thinking or right. saying, we'll take it as Ms. Shaw's opinion yes, that that's, perfectly that's fine. what it was, is an agency staff and right. all of that. Okay. Understood. Ms. Wrinkle, last comment, 30 seconds. Just to reiterate that, this would be my opinion as well, that the vast majority of ProVenge, which is a very, very, very small service to begin with, is done in a physician's office setting, not in a hospital setting. So as we well know, reporting of services in hospital settings is very different, and it has to follow cost reporting principles to maintain the integrity of both the inpatient and the outpatient uh, prospective payment systems. That's why this is very different. Okay. Any more discussion? Any recommendations from the panel? Dr. As, as we're really interested in the right care for the right patient in the right place and figuring out how much it costs to make it sustainable, I would recommend that the panel recommend these, these, these recommendations on page 43 and 44. So um, could you be specific so that the transcriptionists can capture that? Yeah, just, the, uh, and if you want to change them in any way, you know, change them, but just so she can capture it, make sure she has it correctly in the panels. So the, the key part is on page 44, and that's the, that's the recommendation for the following status indicators and APC assignments. Okay. And I, the chart there is, is what I would recommend that we forward along as our recommendation. Okay. Any second? Seconded. Seconded. Okay. So specifically, the recommendation would be that the um, CPT codes, Category 3 CPT codes, have status indicator changes from, for all four from B to S. And specifically for 05X1T, I'm just repeating it so that the panel and everyone can hear, uh, 05X1T, um, they're suggesting uh, APC placement of 5242 with a payment rate of, well, an APC placement of 5242. For 05X2T, they are um, requesting an APC placement of 5241. For 05X3T, which is the receipt and preparation um, placement in APC 5241. And for 05X4T, placement in Five two APC five two four two. Right. That's that's correct. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Discussion. Dr. Hambert, can I? No. All uh, those in favor say and signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. Abstentions. Dr. Maneker, from his previous um, conflict, so moved. Thank you. Next, we're going to have um, we're going to talk about clinic visit payment policy and accepted off-campus provider-based department service line expansion. Um, we have an overview from Ms. Elise Berenger, and um, we're going to have a public presentation by Dr. Randall Oyer, who used to be a member of the panel. Welcome back. And potentially, Mr. Michael Beebe, who will join. AB, thank you. Um, you can say that again when you get up there. There's also, a, and that presentation is on page 50, 48, sorry. And there's a comment letter that we'll talk about after their presentation on 52, and then we'll have a discussion. Okay. Let's start with Ms. Berenger. Hi, my name is Elise Berenger, and I'm going to be providing an overview of two proposed policies from the calendar year 
2019 OPPS proposed rule, um, the first being a proposal to adjust payment for the clinic visit under the OPPS when it's furnished in an off-campus department. As stated in the calendar year 2019 OPPS proposed rule, CMS is concerned that there has been an unnecessary increase in the volume of clinic visits furnished in off-campus provider-based departments. In the calendar year 2019 OPPS proposed rule, we noted that total spending has been growing at a rate of roughly 8% per year under the OPPS, and total spending under the OPPS is projected to further increase by more than $5 billion from approximately $70 billion in calendar year 2018 through calendar year 2019 to nearly $75 billion. This is approximately twice the total estimated spending in calendar year 2008. The OPPS was originally designed to manage Medicare spending growth. However, to the contrary, the OPPS has been the fastest growing sector of Medicare payments out of all the payment systems under Medicare Parts A and B. We are concerned that the rate of growth suggests that payment incentives rather than patient acuity or medical necessity may be affecting site of service decision making. This site of service selection has an impact not only on the Medicare program, but also on Medicare beneficiary out of pocket spending. Therefore, to the extent that there are lower cost sites of service available, as we stated in the calendar year 2019 OPPS proposed rule, we believe that beneficiaries and the physicians treating them should have a choice for the best site of service for the necessary medical care and that financial considerations should not drive care to the higher paid setting. In the calendar year 2017 OPPS interim final rule, we noted that the most frequently billed service with the PO modifier was described by HICPIC's code G0463 hospital outpatient clinic visit for assessment and management of a patient, which is paid under APC 5012 clinic visits and related services. The, number of ser the total number of calendar year 2017 claims for this service was approximately 11 million. As stated in the calendar year 2019 OPPS proposed rule, we are proposing to use our authority under section 1833 T2F of the act to pay an amount equal to the site-specific physician fee schedule payment rate for non-accepted items and services furnished by a non-accepted off-campus provider-based department um, for the clinic visit service, as described by HICPIC's code G0463, when provided at an off-campus provider-based department except, accepted from section 1833 T21 of the act. These are departments that build the modifier PO on claim lines. Off-campus provider-based departments that are not accepted from section 603, departments that build the PN modifier, already receive a physician fee schedule equivalent payment rate for the clinic visit. In calendar year 2019, for an individual Medicare beneficiary, the standard unadjusted Medicare OPPS proposed payment for the clinic visit is approximately $116, with approximately $23 being the average copayment. The, propo the proposed physician fee schedule equivalent rate for Medicare payment for a clinic, vi clinic visit would be approximately $46, and the copayment would be approximately $9. This would save beneficiaries an average of $14 per visit. Under this proposal, an accepted off-campus provider-based department would continue to bill HICPIC's code G0463 with the PO modifier in calendar year 2019, but the payment rate for services described by HIC HICPIC's code G0463 when billed with modifier PO would now be the equivalent to the payment rate for services described by HICPIC's code G0463 when billed with modifier PN. In addition to the proposal we are making for 2019, we are interested in the public's feedback on additional items or services that may be overutilized in hospital outpatient departments. We are also interested in comments on what other methods could be employed to control for an unnecessary increases in hospital outpatient department utilization in future years. Um, the next proposed policy I'm going to talk about is um, the proposal on accepted off-campus provider-based department service line expansion. In the calendar year 2017 OPPS proposed rule, we, we proposed that if an accepted off-campus provider-based department furnished items and services from a clinical family of services 
as described in the proposed rule, that it did not furnish prior to November 2nd, 2015, and thus did not also bill for services from these new clinical families of services would not be considered covered outpatient services under the OPPS and instead would be paid under the physician fee schedule. Although we did not finalize our proposal in the calendar year OPPS final calendar year 2017 OPPS final rule, we expressed concern that if an accepted off-campus provider-based department could expand the types of services provided at their facilities and also be paid OPPS rates for these new types of services, hospitals may be able to pur purchase additional physician practices and expand services furnished by existing accepted off-campus provider-based departments as a result. As stated in the calendar year 2019 OPPS proposed rule, we continue to be concerned that if accepted off-campus provider-based departments are allowed to furnish new types of services that were not provided at such facilities prior to the date of enactment of the Bipartisan Budget, Budget Act of 2015 and can be paid OPPS rates for these new types of services, hospitals may be able to purchase additional physician practices and add those physician practices to existing accepted off-campus provider-based departments, resulted in, resulting in newly purchased physician practices furnishing services that are paid at OPPS rates, which we believe the Section 603 amendments to 1833T of the Social Security Act are intended to prevent. Therefore, for calendar year 2019, we are proposing that if an off-campus, that if an accepted off-campus provider-based department furnishes a service from a clinical family of services, as described in this proposal, for which it did not previously furnish a service and furnish a service and subsequently bill for that service prior to November 2nd, 2015, services from this new clinical family of services will not be considered covered outpatient services under the OPPS. Instead, services in the new clinical family of services would be paid under the physician fee schedule and are thus out of scope of the HOP panel. Thank you. Thank you. Judge Oy. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hambrick, uh, panel and the uh, CMS staff for uh, allowing us to present today. My name is Randall Oyer. I'm a medical oncologist. I'm the medical director of the Ann B. Barshinger Cancer Institute, part of the University of Pennsylvania and Lancaster General Health in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Today I'm here in a volunteer role representing the Association of Community Cancer Centers, uh, which is an advocacy group representing about 24,000 providers, 2,100 different hospitals and practices, and we estimate that uh, cancer patients in the country, uh, about 65% receive care from one of our members. We'd like to uh, thank you for your time today and uh, note that over the years, the ACCC has appreciated the opportunity to uh, discuss our concerns with the panel. We'd also like to take note today that uh, this year, the short time frame uh, between the release of the proposed rule on July 25th and the deadline for submission of this statement on July 30th was rather, was rather short. We were disappointed that we didn't have time for uh, full analysis, uh, and we're hopeful that the panel, CMS staff, and all the stakeholders are still able to have a meaningful and robust uh, discussion around this issue. As you know, in CMS uh, proposed OPPS rule for 2019, the agency proposes several significant changes to payments for items and services that are critical to cancer care. These proposals include drastic reductions in payments, up to 40%, uh, or rather down to 40% of the standard OPPS rate for clinic visits at off-campus off departments that are accepted from six, uh, Section 603 of the Bipartisan Budget Act of 2015. Uh, as authority for this proposal, CMS cites the statutory pres uh, provision of, on development of a method for controlling unnecessary increases in the volume of covered outpatient ser uh, department services. CMS also proposes to apply the same rate to services in certain clinical families furnished at accepted off-campus departments. We're deeply concerned about these proposals and the effect that they may have on cancer care if implemented. We're dividing our remarks into four comments today. First, uh, CMS poses a series of questions in the proposed rule about how it might develop a method for controlling unnecessary increases in the volume of outpatient provider department services other than clinic visits. 
These are important questions, and they require thoughtful consideration, analysis, and input from all stakeholders, including the HOP panel, before such method uh, is implemented. Secondly, before using a reduction in payment for clinic visits as a method for controlling unnecessary increases in volume, CMS should first analyze the effects of the same payment reduction in non-accepted uh, departments. That change already took place on January 1, 2018, following a year of payment at 50% of the OPPS rate, and CMS has presented no data to show what the effect of that change has been. Thirdly, we believe that the proposed payment rate for clinic visits in expanded clinical families of accepted off-campus departments of 40% of the OPPS would be inadequate to support access to these important services. Not all clinic visits are the same, not all families of clinical services are the same, and we think that clinic visits are actually one of the most cost-effective tools in controlling uh, the cost of care. That's where consultation uh, with a patient happens to keep people out of the emergency room and out of uh, more expensive uh, sites of care. We sincerely believe that the proposed rates do not uh, reflect the cost of providing complex, comprehensive, and compassionate hair, uh, care in the outpatient department. And we also note that CMS has not provided a solid rationale for supporting payment of any service at 40% of its OPPS rate. A reimbursement cut of 60% in one year for any service would be difficult to absorb. absorb. A cut of 60% to clinic visits one of our most widely used tools and central to all cancer care would have a shocking effect on hospitals. If these cuts are implemented, hospitals would need to consider reducing access and availability of off-campus services, increasing burdens of care to patients who would need to travel further to the central hospital and potentially cause delays in care. And fourth, Applying the payment reduction to expansion of services in certain clinical families currently paid under the OPPS would be operationally complex and could pose an administrative burden to hospitals, CMS, uh, CMS contractors to uh, identify, track, and monitor billing for clinical services. Under the current proposal, each hospital would need to identify the services provided at each of its campuses and identify the APC. Uh, assignment to each service and determine which modifier had to be used. We also believe that the proposed reduction could significantly uh, undermine the ability to provide full service cancer care in settings that are convenient and accessible to patients. Cancer care often requires complex services including imaging, drugs, and radiation oncology. Many of our members provide these services at one location at departments that are distributed throughout the community. And we know that patients prefer this as well. Limiting, under, uh, limiting payment under the OPPS to the clinical families of facility billed prior to November 1, 2015 could deny a hospital the ability to update services and facilities to meet patient needs. For all these reasons, we are asking the HOP panel to recommend that CMS not implement the proposed reductions in payment for clinic visits in expanded clinical families of services at accepted off-patient uh, departments in the OPPS final rule for calendar year 2019. Uh, on behalf of the ACCC, we thank you for the opportunity to prevent, uh, present our thoughts today. Thank you. Did you have a comment, Mr. Beebe? You have two minutes. Thank you. Um, yes, Michael Beebe on behalf of the um, uh, Medical Device Manufacturers Association. My comments are actually broader than the clinic visit payment policy because our letter is, is across the whole proposed rule. I'm not sure how I got put in this category. But if you'd beg my indulgence, I just could read my comments. Two minutes. All right, I'll go quick. <laughs> um, so to begin, the uh, MDMA appreciates that CMS is willing to pursue proposals to reduce payment obstacles, uh, to produce alternatives to opioids, and the delivery of non-opioid anesthetics. So we, we compliment you on that. Um, before getting into the specific proposals, we want to comment uh, on the role of the HOP panel. Um, MDMA believes that CMS should use the HOP panel 
and the public meeting each year as opportunities to gather advice on potential expansions of packaging policies before deciding on whether to include them in the proposed and final rule. The early deadline for submissions for this meeting combined with increasing complexity of the OPPS methodology and the time needed to run calculations makes it nearly impossible to provide detailed comments to the panel in written statements. This year, the comment deadline is only a few days after the release of the proposed rule, which is extremely tight. Uh, turning to the substance of CMS's proposal, um, we'll ask the uh, HOP panel to make the following recommendations. Uh, CMS should evaluate the impact of all packaging policies on access to care before implementing any new packaging proposals. As we've done in the past, the MDMA continues to ask the HOP panel to recommend that CMS report on the effects of its packaging proposals on access to items and services that no longer are separately reimbursed. This report should be shared with the panel and stakeholders before implementing any further packaging proposals so that the panel and stakeholders can provide detailed comments. CMS should allow sufficient time and adequate data to be collected to better understand the impact of packaging changes and to verify that the proposed rates accurately reflect hospital costs. More clarity is needed around how CMS calculates payment rates for APCs and CAPCs as the agency expands packaging and bundling. We're concerned that the larger bundles CMS has implemented in recent years may not produce rates that accurately reflect the costs of services provided. CMS should continue to require complete and correct coding for packaged services to ensure that the agency has accurate data for use in setting future payment rates. We urge CMS to remain as transparent as possible when using data to set APC payment rates. The MDMA complements CMS's change to the methodology used for assigning device intensive status to calculate the offset amounts at the HCPCS code rather level rather than the, at the APC level. We also support CMS's proposal to modify the device intensive criteria to allow procedures that involve surgically inserted or implanted single-use devices that meet the device offset percentage threshold to qualify as device-intensive procedures, regardless of whether the device remains in the patient's body after the conclusion of the procedure, and to modify the criteria to lower the device offset percentage threshold from 40% to 30% to allow a greater number of procedures to qualify as device-intensive. Finally, uh, germane to this particular topic, CMS should not implement the proposed reductions in payment for clinic visits and expanded clinical families of service at accepted off-campus departments. We believe the 60% the cut and 40% payment is too steep and the impact on uh, services is uncertain at this time. So we would not support that proposal. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Beebe. You kept me from having, we got this as a comment letter, so then I don't have to summarize it. So you actually did me a favor. Thank you, Mr. Beebe, for coming. I'm always glad to do it. Okay. Um, any questions for the presenters? And then we, I see we have some people not queuing up at the microphone. Uh, Dr. Manica? Okay. Yeah, I've, I've, uh, I've got a couple of things to say and a couple of questions along the way. Um, First, I, I want to thank uh, Dr. Royer and Mr. Beebe for coming here and bringing this issue before us today. I, I believe that your hypothesis that the delayed publication of the proposed rule uh, explains the absence of what I would have predicted to be a slew of other people and organizations <coughs> joining you. I'm, I'm shocked to not see the American Association of Medical Colleges and most medical uh, specialty societies um, here in support of opposing the implementation of this uh, proposed rule on, on outpatient clinics. Um, the, the first question I have is actually for uh, Ms. Barringer and, and CMS broadly. As I, I read the materials, <coughs> the hypothesis here is that the increases in the volume of these visits is unnecessary and, and reflects overutilization. And to me, this reads as a hypothesis. I, I haven't seen data, evidence, or analysis that this is, in fact, true. 
Uh, and when I think about the landscape of what's going on in, in medicine right now, uh, there are other, certainly other explanations for increases in clinic visits. One, one obvious one being that large institutions are in fact purchasing practices and creating larger vertically integrated delivery systems. Uh, I, I think to all the physicians present, they, they're aware of how difficult it is for physicians to be maintaining small to medium-sized <coughs> independent uh, practices. There's certainly been other examples of shifts in services which have not been responded to by pulling funds out of one of the various buckets of the Medicare program. For 15 years, previously, inpatient-only procedures have been moved to the outpatient setting and to the physician office setting. Uh, those, those increased costs have been borne by the physician fee schedule without offsets because it's statutorily prohibited from the hospital outpatient bucket in B or, or Part A. And here we have an example of an, an increase in Part B, presumably reflecting a decrease in the physician visits, and, and the proposal is to pull $600 million out of the entire uh, Medicare system. <coughs> this is gonna have a significant impact to, to everyone, providers as well as uh, beneficiaries. Um, other explanations for the increased number of visits and the reduced physician office visits could simply be the, the aggregation of those practices so that healthcare delivery systems can follow along with CMS initiatives like accountable care organizations, advanced accountable care organizations, and a variety of other risk-bearing um, uh, pilot and demonstration <coughs> projects that, that have been going on for the past years. So there, there are certainly other explanations for the observed phenomenon beside the interpretation that it's unnecessary overutilization. So uh, I personally would hope the panel seriously consider the request and move to uh, 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 recommend that, in fact, CMS not implement this proposal for office visits. Um, would you like to state that as a recommendation now or wait until you hear some more comments? Well, I'll, I'll wait to hear some more comments. And, and okay. also, if there is, in fact, any data, evidence, analysis to support the hypothesis that the increase in visits reflect unnecessary overutilization. Okay. Well, let's staff while on that okay. while we hit it. Oh, that's no. Just if I could follow up, it does seem like we already have a mechanism through our max to determine if we have unnecessary or medically unnecessary care. I don't know as I, at least the MACs that we um, uh, participate with, I don't know as I've seen any LCDs or anything that would put in place something that would actually figure out which claims are unnecessary and just deny them and not compromise the entire system. I, I would concur, and since our MAC is different from your MAC, that five. makes <laughs> your, okay. So uh, I, I would concur. Uh, many MACs, in fact, do monitor very carefully for unnecessary, medically unnecessary visits. Yes, go ahead. I think along with, with the suggestion is, you know, we're seeing a switch from inpatient to outpatient. So look at the inpatient utilization along with the outpatient utilization, because I think we're all moving towards bringing more to the outpatient environment and, and decreasing our inpatient utilization. Okay. Yeah, I, I wanted to say exactly the same thing. I mean, this is a good thing that we're bringing in to out for everybody for financially as well as for patient health. So, yeah, you need to look at all of that context. So I'm also curious to have the same questions. Okay. Hi, I'm Rosalind Schulman with the American Hospital Association. I was going to say I wanted to associate myself with everything that Dr. Um, Oyer said about the two site neutral proposals, but now I want to associate myself with what all of you have said <laughs> <laughs> with regard to these two site neutral proposals. And I would like to note that it's um, that the potential impacts that Dr. Oyer uh, described are not limited to cancer care, but would uh, impact all outpatient care. 
Um, like the ACCC, we also urge the committee to recommend that CMS not finalize the expanded site-neutral uh, site payment proposals that were included in the proposed rule. Um, and I would also like to add that we believe that both the clinic visit policy and the expanded families of services policy misinterpret congressional intent by proposing to reduce payment in accepted off-campus provider-based departments that Congress explicitly protects from site-neutral cuts in Section 603 of the BBA. Further, with regard to the proposed site-neutral payment reduction for clinic visits, um, the agency proposes its payment cut as uh, Dr. Manneker and others have noticed uh, uh, without presenting its own analysis demonstrating that clinic visit volume growth was due to shifting of volume from physician offices to accepted provider-based departments due to payment differentials rather than other factors, some of which um, you all uh, mentioned. So um, explaining increases in OPPS expenditures um, on unnecessary shifting of services from physician offices ignores many other factors um, that may that are outside of the hospital's control or even inside the hospital's control that, that can drive increases in OPPS expenditures, such as escalation in the price of drugs, other Medicare policies, such as things coming off the inpatient only list or the two midnight policy, or, or just changing beneficiary needs. Um, similarly, with regard to the family of services proposal, it's notable that the agency does not present claims-based or other evidence that demonstrates that accepted off-campus provider-based departments have taken unfair advantage of the current policy, um, despite the fact that the agency had previously indicated it would monitor service line expansion. Um, we also want to echo ACCC's comments about the operational complexity and administrative burden that a family of services policy would pose on hospitals. And then finally, we believe that both of these site-neutral proposals endanger the critical role that hospital outpatient departments play in their communities, uh, including providing convenient access to care for the most vulnerable beneficiaries, including the sickest and most medically complex patients. Um, it, we think additional cuts to the outpatient payment of the magnitude that are proposed in this rule um, would be excessive and harmful, and we're concerned that the policy will reduce patient access to hospital-based outpatient care that is not otherwise available in the community, and that would undermine the ability of hospitals to adequately fund um, their emergency standby capacity as well. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Swaggart and then Dr. Manneker. I'm fine with waiting after the other oh, presenters. Sorry. Okay, then Dr. Manneker. Okay, um, just one other piece of... Uh, potential explanation contributing to the shift of services. So uh, just published in the last month online in JAMA Internal Medicine was an analysis of the CMS transitional care management data, which I've been waiting to come out for several years. And what that analysis showed is that those transitional care services did in fact save the overall program large numbers of dollars by reducing hospital readmissions, exactly the intent of those services. I'm sure a significant portion of those services were provided in hospital outpatient departments that would add to the cost in Part B and the hospital outpatient system, but of course that's reducing inpatient admissions and shown to be financially viable. So another reason not to proceed with the proposed rule. Thank you. Quickly, Dr. Oyen, then come up, madam. Dr. Hembrick, uh, I, I, I know that uh, you and CMS face a lot of difficult decisions, and they're often, you know, uh, stakeholders on both sides. I have to tell you, this was really surprising to me because I think it's off target. Uh, none of us wants to see um, un one unnecessary visit, one unnecessary test. I think that the clinic visit, the outpatient clinic visit, again, is one of the most useful, cost-effective tools we have in our entire armamentarium. It's where so many services get bundled into one fee, the social worker, the chaplain, all of the support team that's bundled into an office visit that provides multidisciplinary care that, uh, in, that uh, implements shared decision-making, keeps patients away from more expensive care. In terms of the outpatient expansion, uh, I think that we have to be able to innovate and bring more services, more comprehensive new services into the most convenient, lowest cost setting for our patients. If it's set and you can't change, where does the innovation come from to uh, 
lower costs in the future. It just stays the way it is. Thank you. Madam? My name is Angela Simmons from Vanderbilt University Medical Center in Nashville, Tennessee. I just, I'm probably the second echo, um, but I wanted to get up and say um, for the panel to consider when they're making their recommendation that each and every service that's provided to a registered hospital outpatient has to be, whether it's diagnostic or therapeutic, has to be ordered by a clinician and it has to be medically necessary. And at this point, CMS has not presented, as you noted, any data that indicates that the services that are ordered by the clinicians at these outpatient hospital accepted locations are not medically necessary, nor, as they contend, are the services not related to the increased acuity of our patients. And so I just wanted to make sure that those thoughts were on the record. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Kathy Norbosch, University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. I'd like to also comment on the two, two proposals just discussed, the 60% 60, 60 payment reduction and the clinical family. At our health system, we're continuous, continuously looking to provide a better patient experience as well as expert clinical care. With that goal in mind, we want to provide these services where the patients live in the community settings in these outpatient departments. <coughs> Um, I think that these, um, these two proposals will definitely impact patients' access to care and the, avail the availability to provide this comprehensive expert care. Um, in addition, I'm also trying to struggle with um, the operational burden of representing these systems on our claim when um, we have to look at that line in sand to say that this is what we were doing now. What is an expansion of clinical service? Is it a brand new CPT code that's been added? Or is it in the same code range in the CPT book? It is in the same APC family. Um, I just think to go to the individual line item of the charge master, if that's where we're going to have to do this with a modifier, I think it's going to be extremely burdensome to um, healthcare facilities facilities as well. So again, I urge CMS to reconsider these two proposals. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Um, Anna Santoro from Harvard Healthcare. Closer, a little louder. Okay. Sorry. Uh, Anna Santoro from Harvard Healthcare in Connecticut. And um, we disagree with the proposal to reduce our uh, visit payments based on a couple of subjective um, things that we're hearing. We're asking for some, we have some clarifying questions. And um, one of them is we hear over and over again, unreasonable growth. And exactly what does that mean, unreasonable? Um, what is the number, for example, of beneficiaries enrolling in the Medicare system today than previously, maybe in the past 10 years. So we'd like to have that defined of what is unreasonable. And I find that it's a very subjective uh, word unless we have fact to kind of establish that and we haven't seen what that means. In addition to that, um, we're looking for some data. Has CMS compared, do they have a physician file? Have they compared what, the, what is seen in the physician side versus the hospital side in these hospital outpatient setting? Is it always a one-to-one? -one? Is it maybe just a physician visit, um, et cetera? So we're actually looking for more data. And I think without the data, I don't think that CMS should move forward with these, this proposal for reducing the payment. I think we should study this a little bit more before we go that route. I think that our hospitals provide services in these off-campus provider-based location as a convenience to patients to really provide services to these patients. Um, I'm hearing also it is a transition. I mean, it could be a post-op transition. I think hospitals really set foot with trying to do the best that they can for their patients. Um, and with that, we'd like to have some additional data and ask that you do not move forward with this. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Beth Gillis. I'm a member of the Provider Roundtable, and I work for Baptist Health South Florida. And although I don't often admit it, I'm a Medicare beneficiary. Um, <laughs> in the past year, I've had two family members who have undergone 
bone marrow transplants. I can tell you from direct personal experience the effects that these life-saving treatments have on both patients and their caregivers. Even travel within an urban area to a provider location 35 miles from your home in city traffic to one of many necessary follow-up visits, sometimes two or three times a week, is a complicating factor that only adds to the stressful, harrowing situation. Not every hospital has the expertise to treat complex diseases. Without provider-based locations, the only choice is to travel to a cancer center. But cancer care is just one example. There's cardiovascular care, too. There's many other examples. To the extent that CMS policy, proposed policy, limits the ability of hospitals to offer their life-saving services and treatments to beneficiaries, I would encourage the panel to recommend that CMS not approve the reduction in payment for the clinic visit code and the limitation on expansion. CMS, CMS states that the increase in volume of clinic visits is due to hospitals purchasing physician practices. CMS should consider why hospitals are purchasing physician practices. Perhaps it's because the payment physician practices receive don't cover the cost. Um, CMS should consider the shift in volume from inpatient to outpatient and the advancement in medicine that allows services to be provided as outpatient rather than inpatient. I would ask the panel to recommend CMS not move forward with a reduction in payment for the clinic visit code. If they determine they want to move forward in the future, I would ask that the agency take a careful look at whether the increase in volume is truly due to what is referred to as unnecessary visits and consider the impact on Medicare beneficiaries. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Flo? I'm on the board of our clinically integrated network and accountable care organization in central Minnesota that covers about a, a fifth or a sixth or so of the entire state, and Midwestern states are big. They're not small, like, like here. <clears throat> <laughs> so this is, this is several different organizations and several different organizational structures that are integrated and not integrated and private practices and for-profit and not-for-profit and, and city-owned and whatever. It's very, very clear from our local data that more visits saves money. More visits to the doctor's office saves emergency department visits, saves uh, hospital stay time and saves nursing home time, all three. So much so that when we created our pro forma to try to win with the next iteration of, of, uh, of uh, pay for performance, then we, have, uh, we were trying to figure out how much we had to increase and even if it was possible to increase it that much. So it may well be that that's not a unique situation and that is one of the drivers of the increased utilization of outpatient visits is the incentives for different systems and different organizations and entities to try to shift the cost to the lower cost situation. Thank you. Um, Ms. Bate, could you see if there are any comments from the, on the phone? And I would, if anyone wants to speak, one minute on your comment. And please provide us with something, I won't say new, but something that has not exactly been expressed as others have expressed here in the room. So Ms. Spate, could you open the lines and see if anyone wants to comment? All lines have been unmuted. Okay, hearing none, um, Ms. Weigert. Hi, I'm, I'm going to respond to some of the, the comments and concerns that were raised with respect to the clinic visit proposal, and then David Rice will speak to the expansion of services under Section 603 of the Bipartisan Budget Act. So I, I do just want to start by saying that all of you on the panel and, and in the audience have raised uh, very good comments and questions for consideration, and I do hope that we see these concerns and, and considerations reflected in the public comments so that they can be taken into consideration in development of the final rule. Um, I, I do want to just answer um, or at least speak to a bit on a couple of the specific questions and concerns that were raised with respect to sort of the rationale for the proposal. Um, so in, in the proposed rule, 
um, which was published in the Federal Register on July 31st. Um, the discussion begins on page 37138. And there, there's a bit of a history there um, with respect to the growth in expenditures under the OPPS as a payment system. The provision that's being discussed today with respect to the clinic visit has to do with unnecessary increases in utilization um, under the OPPS. And that's different from what a couple of uh, folks have brought up with respect to uh, medically unnecessary services. So something that's medically unnecessary by law cannot be covered under Medicare. And this proposal is not a coverage proposal. It's a payment proposal. So we're not, um, there, although the, the word um, unnecessary can be confusing there, um, there, there is a distinction in that the proposal that is set forth in the, in the proposed rule has to do with the payment. What is the appropriate payment level for the clinic visit? As you all know, a, a visit can occur in, in many different settings, including the physician office setting, and there's some discussion there. And as I said earlier, the, the payment under the physician fee schedule is not within scope for the panel. But just to give a, a little bit of background as to the, the rationale, to the extent that a visit occurs in the office setting, there, there is a different payment that exists from Medicare um, as well as from the, the beneficiary who's receiving services. We are very interested in seeing comments on how that's different um, when that visit occurs in the physician office setting from when it occurs in the hospital outpatient setting. We've presented some data here on, on the utilization of services. As you know, the visit is the most common service billed under the OPPS. Sometimes it's billed with other services, sometimes it's not. But to the extent that the same service, and, and I will note that the coding construct is different under the physician fee schedule than it is under the OPPS, there's still the, the 10 different levels of, of visits for a new or established patient, patient that can be billed under the, the fee schedule, whereas under the OPPS, it's all, it's just one, um, one level that's all bundled together. But if, if everyone is familiar and hopefully reads very closely the information that we included in the proposed rule, it does talk about some of the increases um, that we've observed over time, it talks about the OPPS being the fastest growth sector in terms of Medicare spending. The provision that we're talking about was added at the beginning of the OPPS. Um, and while I don't think any of us are in a place to, to speak to um, what was going on in the mind of Congress when it established this provision, um, that is a provision that has been included in the OPPS payment system since the beginning. And so to the extent that there is a lot of growth um, in the system, there is a mechanism to remove the payment for that. And again, that's separate from a coverage determination. There's also some reports um, cited by the, the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission or MedPAC, and I would encourage folks to familiarize themselves with those studies as well to the extent that they talk about increases in in the volume of visits and um, other services. And to the extent that more data would be helpful, I think um, we would like to see that in the comments. And also um, a couple of, of folks have mentioned doing a comparison to the inpatient. And I think we would, we would be very interested in seeing comments that speak to how specifically the clinic visit itself um, has or has a bearing on inpatient to outpatient in terms of why that um, should be borne out in, in the analysis that we have here versus a comparison to the physician fee schedule and which can build the, the same service. Thanks, Tiffany. Uh, I just wanted to offer one comment on the uh, accepted off-campus provider-based department service line expansion um, to make clear that uh, this proposal, um, that there's nothing in this proposal that is preventing existing accepted off-campus provider-based departments from expanding the service lines that they offer, um, that this uh, provision would only require that if they do offer a new service line that they were not, uh, they did not provide any services for in the baseline period, that that new service line would be paid at, would be billed with the modifier PN and paid at the PFS equivalent rate as would any new uh, 
non-accepted off-campus provider-based department. So I just want to make sure that was clear. Thank you. Um, any more comments from the panel? Recommendations from the panel? I'll move that the panel recommend CMS not implement this proposal for outpatient visits. Just outpatient visits, not the service line? Are you going to do the, 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 the entire specific? So outpatient visits, outpatient. reduction in payment in outpatient visits, and um, the provision that talks about restrictions in service line expansions. Uh, yes, I'll accept that correct? as a friendly <laughs> amendment to my motion. I'm just trying to be clear so that we know what we're talking about. Uh, anybody else? I mean, any second? Oh. Uh, can I make, can I I'm make sorry. A, can I make a comment? Yes. So I, I just have to say as I sit here and listen to all of this, I think it's acknowledged, but I just want to verbalize that this is a complicated issue. So it's not so simple as shifting inpatient to outpatient. We're talking about site of service also. And when we're talking about overutilization, it hasn't clearly been stated, but I suspect an issue is the site of service of these outpatient visits. So while I agree with the idea of asking CMS or us recommending CMS to forego the proposal for this year, I think added to that should be a recommendation for study so we can understand a little better what they mean by overutilization. And we, we can understand some of the factors that have been brought forward here. So I, I would just ask that we kind of delineate not just a recommendation to forego it, but a request for additional information. Well, I'll accept that as recommendation for additional study as another friendly amendment because one of the points I did not bring up is that another reason systems or purchasing practices and increasing hospital visits is to uh, increase aggregate size for managed care contracting and having appropriate <coughs> market share in parallel with the CMS uh, risk-bearing initiatives and pilot and demonstration projects like accountable care organizations. So I'll accept that recommendation as a friendly amendment. Second. Second. Okay. Any further discussion from the panel? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Okay, thank you. All right, now that we're off time, we're gonna give everybody their specific time. So Ms. Spate, um, we're gonna continue on with the um, panel meeting. We still will um, take a break after we hear all the presentations and that type of stuff. Okay, so next we're gonna move on to CAPCs and device edit skin substitute products and endovascular and musculoskeletal ABCs. Mr. Shane Dorsey from Avermel will present. The presentation is on page 58. Great, thank you, Dr. Hambrick, and um, good afternoon to all the panel members. Um, once again, Avermel appreciates the opportunity to appear before the panel to um, present um, views of our membership which is comprised of the smallest and largest medical technology innovators and companies. And we remain interested in ensuring patient access to life-saving and life-enhancing devices and um, technologies. And today we'll be commenting on two general areas. One, reconfiguring APCs in the context of CAPCs, complexity adjustments and device edits. And then we'll be speaking um, to some specific APC requests. So in the context of comprehensive APCs, comprehensive APCs have been in place since calendar year 2014. And during the time since implementation of CAPCs, additional um, comprehensive APCs have been introduced to the system. And um, Avamet just encourages the panel to recommend that CMS continue to analyze the claims data and to report on the impact of comprehensive APC changes on affected codes and any impacts on patient access to services that are bundled under the comprehensive APCs. With regard to complexity adjustments, CMS has developed a process for identifying and applying complexity adjustments to certain combinations of codes as part of the comprehensive APC policy. And we have repeatedly expressed concerns regarding appropriate application of complexity criteria and the resulting APC assignments for codes within the CAPCs. We appreciate CMS's effort to reevaluate um, some of the complexity adjustment criteria that was included in this year's proposed rule. However, due to the timing of statement submission, coupled with the late release of the rule, we are unable to provide recommendations on this issue at this time, but definitely do look forward to um, providing CMS with comments on this issue as part of our overall outpatient comment submission. 
With regard to device edits, we've previously expressed concerns regarding the elimination of device edits, as they have historically been very useful in ensuring the collection of accurate cost data. And we continue to request that the panel recommend that CMS monitor claims data to evaluate the need to reinstate all device edits. With regard to packaging items and services into APCs, for the upcoming calendar year, CMS is proposing to continue its calendar year 2018 policy of packaging payment for skin substitute products and paying for these products via a high and low cost APC structure. The agency has noted that they've received stakeholder input regarding the current payment methodology and is inviting feedback for consideration of proposed alternatives um, to the existing payment structure. AVIMED supports CMS's recommendation to allow stakeholders time to analyze and comment on the potential ideas raised for calendar year 2019 while continuing its calendar year 2018 policy of assigning skin substitutes to the high or low cost group. We believe it's important to maintain stability in the payment system for skin substitute products while um, potential improvements to the methodology are considered. And now I have, just have very two brief, very, two very brief, I'm sorry, comments on endovascular and musculoskeletal APCs. So for several comment cycles, we have expressed concern regarding the composition of endovascular procedure APC groupings. And um, while CMS is proposing to maintain the existing four-level structure for calendar year 2019, we do appreciate the agencies being responsive to stakeholder input by also soliciting comment on the development of a five or six-level um, structure for endovascular APC procedures. And we look forward to working with the um, agency on these issues. Similar with regard to musculoskeletal APCs, AVMA has historically expressed concern over um, the grouping of these procedures and whether or not these groupings reflect both clinical and resource homogeneity. And we also, again, appreciate CMS's responsiveness to stakeholder input by opening up this issue for comment um, on the feasibility of creating a new musculoskeletal, musculoskeletal grouping between levels five and six. Um, lastly, I would just add that um, two points that were made earlier by Dr. Maniker and by MDMA. Um, I would hope in future years that there is more than two and a half business days provided between release of the rule and um, development of statements for submission for this meeting, as I think it significantly impacts the robustness of um, statements that can be developed by stakeholders for presentation. But I do appreciate the panel's time. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Ms. Dorsey? Okay, ma'am. Good afternoon. My name is Marcia Nuscart. I'm the executive director of the Alliance of Wound Care Stakeholders. We represent all the clinical associations whose members treat patients with wounds. And I certainly do agree with Ms. Dorsey as well as MDMA about the time frame in which to be able to submit comments because we would have liked to submit written comments, but we just didn't have the opportunity to be able to get our members' input and be able to provide you those particular types of comments. But we will submit our written comments. I did want to mention that we appreciated that CMS recognized the current payment methodologies for the cellular and or tissue-based products for wounds, which the clinical associations you know, call skin substitutes. Um, and we realize that it's not working and it's created perverse incentives. While we're currently examining the four proposed payment methodologies and will offer specific recommendations in our comments, we caution CMS and the panel that none of those methodologies will be successful and achieve the desired results unless CMS utilizes correct and accurate data and for CMS to be responsible to ensure that the products are being billed and coded um, correctly and appropriately. So thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, I'm Anna Santoro, Hartford Healthcare from Connecticut. Um, I want to talk about device edits again. Um, and I say again because we've talked about it here before. Um, with the change in device intensive procedures, with that threshold changing from 40 to 30 percent, there will be more um, devices that are subject to that device to procedure edits. And with that, a few years ago here at the HOP panel, we had talked about that, and I really didn't have a clear understanding of 
why CMS wanted to remove that. And the discussion led to, it wasn't that it was a maintenance issue. The issue was that there were providers that were concerned because not all devices used on the outpatient setting had a HCPCS code. In that year, um, CMS gave us a HCPCS code. So we do have an established unlisted device HCPCS code. In addition to, at the beginning of this um, meeting, the APC and um, Status Indicator Subcommittee um, recommended to reinstate the device procedure code edits. And I'd like to reiterate that it's very helpful for hospitals. It helps with our internal controls. It's something that we've always asked for. And I think if we went back to um, what we said a few years ago at the hot panel, it was because there was an un not an unlisted HCPCS code, and we have that now. Why can't we have that reinstated? So that's kind of my ask. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Bate, is there anyone queued up on the telephone line? Okay. Guess not. Hearing none. Um, thank you, Ms. Dorsey. Thank you. Are there any recommendations with respect to this presentation before you go, Ms. Dorsey? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dorsey. Um, last but not least, we have a presentation from Mr. John Settlemeyer from the Provider Roundtable on packaging and the accuracy of separately payable APCs. Good afternoon, Dr. Hambrick and panel. Thank you very much for the time and opportunity to come before you today. Um, again, my name is John Settlemeyer. I am the former chairperson of the PRT. And with me, I've invited uh, Diana McWade, who is the current vice chair. And we have a presentation today that we would like to share with you regarding uh, packaging. So just as a reminder, we've told you this for 15 years, but the, the Provider Roundtable uh, represents currently 14 hospitals and health systems around the country, and we have representation in about 35 states now. And our you know, primary goal is to provide substantive com comment back to CMS on the financial and operational implications of um, uh, OPPS policies. The presentation today um, is around all payable HCPCS codes which contain package cost. And so this potentially could affect all APCs that, and, and their payment construct. In our presentation today, we will focus in, as an example, the Drug Administration APCs. The PRT does understand that the package is a central concept of a prospective pay, payment system and that packaging has significantly expanded over the past years. And in the um, claims accounting document, there is an explanation for the methodology for estimating package cost. Um, however, we believe there are potentially unanswered questions about the methodology, and also would point out that, you know, as, as a group of volunteers, we don't have the <coughs> me means or the resources to hire a data scientist to replicate the rule, and most individual providers and hospitals are also not going to be able to, uh, to replicate the rule. So it's very helpful um, to providers to be able to understand the impact of packaging upon the APC payment rates. And CMS already publishes uh, some information in the APC offset file, and the examples here are um, drugs above the packaging threshold, policy package drugs and biologicals, and package devices. So for example, again, with the Drug Administration APCs, uh, the, the basis of this table here is, is pulled directly uh, from CMS published data. But for the four Drug Administration APCs, um, we have columns with um, both the percent and the dollar amount of package services that are attributable to the final APC payment rate. And as stated before, uh, the published data includes um, packaging for, for devices, for threshold package drugs and for policy package drugs. 
we have inserted the additional columns to the right, uh, which have question marks, which show that you know, there, there are questions about what amount of, of packaging um, there exists in the APCs as a result of uh, conditionally packaged lab services as well as conditionally packaged ancillary services. Again, taking the Drug Administration APCs as the example here, by, by summing the parts of the partially published data, um, we can see here that, that for instance, um, on the level three drug administration code, it's pushing up you know, pretty close to the APC payment amount. And then on level four drug administration, it actually, the, the amount of partially published package cost exceeds the APC payment amount. Um, we believe that there's a tremendous amount of, of lab packaging and other condition, conditionally packaged services that would also go into these drug administration APCs, but we don't have that visibility to be able to see what additional con contributions they might potentially make to the final uh, calculated APC payment rate. So I'm just going to skip to our recommendation here, and uh, you know the, the, the provider roundtable does ask that the hot panel request CMS to publish packaging data for each major type of packaged cost, and specifically this means CMS should release the package dollars associated with clin lab tests as well as ancillary services that are packaged. Are there any other, any questions from the panel about the presentation? Ms. Oh, got the floor. Mm -hmm. floor. Similar to my first comment earlier today, more data is always better. And I understand that, that, that we need to be able to have complete information. So I support this from that mm -hmm. standpoint. Sure. Uh, so she didn't ask for motions yet. Oh, it, if, a little bit more discussion, if any, and then I'm going to ask, you know, the folks on the phone. <laughs> Ms. Bate, does anyone have a question about this particular, um, or want to make a comment about this particular presentation on the phone? <clears throat> Hearing none. Um, did you have a comment? No. Okay. okay. So, um, are there any recommendations um, from the panel on this issue? I would recommend that the panel recommend to CMS that getting complete information is, is a good thing and that we should have these, these um, packaged payment details available. Okay, um, so I'm going to go to the recommendation that's on page 71, um, which is their request. So are you um, specifically asking about clinical lab tests and ancillary services that are packaged, or were there other um, costs that you wanted to see presented to the panel? The clinical lab test and ancillary services were the ones I was thinking of. Okay, thank but you. I'll be happy to take a from meal amendment if I'm missing something. Oh. Okay. So oh. first, we're going to include laboratory and ancillary. Okay. So I'll, I'll second the, the motion and uh, suggest a friendly amendment of uh, at, just adding the total packaged costs. So that way we'll see how much of the total is uh, accounted for by clinical lab and other ancillaries. Okay. So, yes, Ms. Wagner? That's good. And uh, just a, a question to, to make sure that the, the recommendation as stated is within scope. So I'd, I'd call the, the panel's attention to the charter with respect to the description of duties as relates to packaging. Uh, the charter states reviewing packaging 
um, the cost of items and services, including drugs and devices, into procedures and services, including the methodology for packaging and the impact of packaging the cost of those items and services on APC group structure and payment. So um, to the extent that the recommendation has to do with the methodology for packaging, um, I think it would be helpful to include that information in, in the recommendation itself to make sure that it is within scope for the panel to recommend. That flow is your original recommendation. Uh, I, I'm good with that if somebody wants to word it eloquently <laughs> and concisely. So maybe, well. maybe a preferatory <laughs> comment to the motion is uh, in, in the interests of transparency and validating the methodology, the panel recommends okay. publication of. Okay. We'll let Dana read that back once she. <laughs> yeah, no. Did you get that, Dana? Yeah, well, so that we are clear on the motion. Do you, do you want to hear that? Yes, I do. So I'm happy to withdraw mine and support yours. <laughs> <laughs> it's a team. Yes, yes. Okay. In the interest of transparency and validating the methodology used for packaging, the panel recommends that CMS uh, publish packaged payment details for clinical laboratory test and ancillary services plus total packaged costs. As, as well as total packaged costs. As well costs. as, okay. Okay, plus, all right. Second. Okay. Second. Discussion? Oh, sorry, that's no. Should we include that it be Closer. Excuse me. Should we include that it be published with the proposed and the final rule so that stakeholders have an opportunity to react to it? Please. If you wish. Sure, please. <laughs> okay. Really specific. Yes. All right. All those in favor of the amended motion and rec I'm sorry, recommendation, you signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Okay. Thank so you, panel. Th thank you. This is the part where we do cleanup. And are there any any other comments related to the um, hot panel meeting? Please come forward or or requests. See someone coming to the mic. Good afternoon, Dr. Hambrick and Hops panel. Just a quick uh, couple of comments that I wanted to share regarding the inpatient only list. Uh, Kathy Austin with SSM Health headquartered out of St. Louis, Missouri. We are 18 years post IPO. And just to uh, comment that this has been the most complex and burdensome regulation that we've had to administer in all of our hospitals across four states not to mention the various MACs and the managed care payers that all have different uh, requirements. And along the years, many of the payers have actually adopted such said list. Many have not, which creates uh, a huge nightmare in trying to get a clean claim out to these payers. And it seems like each year we take a bite out of such said list. And last year, referencing um, arthroplasty of the knee, uh, CPT code 27442, 443, 446, and 447 were all given status indicator J1. Yet right in the middle of this, quote, clinical um, and resource similarity of a family, CPT code 27445 remains on the inpatient only list. Same thing with arthroplasty of the ankle. Uh, primary procedure code 27700 has a J1, whereas 27702 and 203 have status indicators of Cs. With the recent um, IPPS final rule uh, eliminating the requirement for physicians' uh, authentication of orders, uh, the request today is to allow uh, physicians and hospitals to determine the best care for their patients and echoing Dr. Flo's comments earlier, right care, right location. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Dr. Manneker? Okay, so Dr. Hambrick, I have one more motion that several panel members discussed earlier this morning. That motion is that the panel meet face-to-face -face with a public session in approximately February 
of each year beginning in 2019. Uh, the three reasons or rationale for that face-to-face -face meeting are number one, so that uh, both the panel and the public can respond to the final rule. Uh, number two, so the panel and CMS can consider other issues in preparation of the proposed rule uh, several months later. Uh, and then lastly, to expand the opportunity for appropriate dialogue between the panel and the public. As has been mentioned several times today, the, the very short time frame from release of the proposed rule uh, uh, to the time for written comments for this meeting was exceedingly short, and having a February meeting to increase the amount of dialogue would certainly improve the process. Thank you for those comments, Dr. Manneker. As um, Dr. Tiffany Swagger didn't read this part of the charter, but that is not quite within the scope of the charter. However, it has been recorded, and we'll take that down as a discussion point and something to consider as we move forward. So thank you for those comments. And um, I see nodding, so I'll take that as a sense of the panel that they would um, echo those thoughts, correct? All right. Okay. Very good. So now we need to do a little cleanup, and that is we did not approve the subcommittee reports or um, earlier for the APC and SI and data because we were waiting for the presentations. So can I have a motion to re to um, approve those subcommittee reports? With one abstention for the committee report commenting on CAR T cells. Correct, and that's the status indicator in APC. APC. Uh, that's the status indicator in APC. Um, and that would be Dr. Manneker. Um, okay. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Okay. Uh, abstentions other than the one mentioned? Okay. So um, we're going to take a break. We're going to take a 20-minute 20 minute break. <laughs> so I want everybody back here at 1.45 for the wrap up session. 1.45 to review the recommendations. All right. Welcome back to the um, um, wrap up of the summary of the, we're going to have a recitation of the recommendations because, Sorry. of course, the Wi-Fi is being, um, yeah, so they weren't able to be transmitted to the staff, so we're going to have Dana read them. If you have any question about what it is, then um, ask Dana to reread it, and then we're going to approve it. Um, most of them, as you can imagine, are about the um, subcommittee recommendations, which we've already seen. So, just concentrate more so on the um, other substantive ones and the wording of same. Okay. Okay. Recommendation number one, the panel recommends that CMS study the value of creating a comprehensive APC for autologous hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. Sounds good. Next. The panel recommends that CMS reassign the status indicators for the following CPT codes from B to S. And these would be the four CPT codes, 05X1T, 2T, 3T, 4T, the four CAR-T codes. Good. And as part of that recommendation, the panel further recommends that CMS assign CPT code 05X1T and 05X4T to APC code 5242, level two blood product exchange and related services and CP code, CPT code 05X2T and CPT code 05X3T to APC code 5241, level one, blood product exchange and related services. Good. Don't, don't add <laughs> The panel recommends that CMS not implement the proposals for reduction in payment for outpatient clinic visits or restrictions to service line expansions. However, the panel recommends that CMS study the matter to better understand and define overutilization. <laughs> to better understand the reasons for increased utilization. Is that agreeable yes. to yes. the panel? Yes. yes. Okay. All right. 
In the interest of validating the packaging methodology, the panel recommends that CMS publish the details of packaging payments, specifically the information for clinical laboratory tests and ancillary services, as well as total packaged costs, and that CMS publish the data with the proposed and final rules so that stakeholders have an opportunity to evaluate and respond to the data. Good. Okay. Okay. And then we're down to the subcommittees. The panel recommends that CMS continue to report clinic and emergency department visit and observation claims data, and if CMS identifies changes in patterns of utilization or cost, that CMS bring those issues before the visits and observation subcommittee in the future. The panel recommends that CMS report data on what percentage of observation stay claims greater than 48 hours have a date of service that begins on a Friday. The panel recommends that the work of the Visits and Observation Subcommittee continue. The panel recommends that Scott Manneker serve as chair of the Visits and Observation Subcommittee. The APC Groups and SI Assignments Committee. The panel recommends that the work of the APC Groups and SI Assignments Subcommittee continue. The panel recommends that Agatha Nolan serve as the chair of the APC Groups and SI Sub Assignments Subcommittee. Data issues. The the panel recommends that CMS provide the data subcommittee a list of APCs fluctuating significantly in costs prior to each panel meeting. The panel recommends that CMS provide the data subcommittee a presentation on the claims accounting process prior to each panel meeting. The panel recommends that the work of the data subcommittee continue. The panel recommends that Erica Hardy serve as the chair of the data subcommittee. And that is all the recommendations. Good. That's it. You're done. All right. Are there um, um, any other comments from panel members? If not, you know I have a few. Like to special thanks always, always, always to the OPPS staff who put this together. Everybody chips in. Everybody does all sorts of things that to support the process and to make this run very well. So I want to give a round of applause to the staff. Especially our new DFO who jumped in with both feet, three feet if she has them, and she only has two, but both feet and, and took the reins and went forward with that. Also, I'd like to obviously thank our transcriptionist and uh, Dana Travis and our new transcriptionist person. I'm not sure exactly what the person does, Raymond Reyes, but he did a good job and um, you know he's supportive there. And last but not least, but I have to mention them, Dr. Dawn Francis, Ms. Ruth Londe, Mr. Michael Schroyer, and Dr. Norm Thompson. You have been uh, great panel members. We've appreciated your contributions, and you will be missed. Thank you very much. <laughs> Safe travels, everybody. And we did get done by two. Thank you. Woo. See you next time. <laughs>